a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 9.46 a.m. when we got to the corner of Beverly Boulevard and Fountain Streets. The Brighton Arms Apartments. 12A, isn't it? Yeah. What is it? Want to try it again? Yeah. Yeah? Miss Anderson? Yeah, that's right. Police officers. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Oh, yeah. Come on in. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Sit down. I'll put some coffee on. All right. That's the only way to do it, Joe. What? Coffee grinder, here. Well, that's what it is, huh? Yeah. You buy the coffee beans, and you grind them up because you need the coffee real fresh. I'm going to get Faye one. I'm great gadgets. Yeah, I guess so. You never tasted coffee that fresh, Joe. Whole different flavor. Well, if you say so. Yeah. Wait till I get Faye one. You'll be asked over for the first pot of coffee. That's nice. You got a match? Yes, ma'am. Here. It's about the burglary, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. A couple of questions we'd like to ask. Go ahead. We've got the report you gave the officers last night. Now, this list of stolen property. I wonder if you look at it and see if it's right. Here you are. Diamond watch... Yeah. Mm-hmm. The mink. Yeah, that's it. It's the mink that's important. It took me three years working to get that. Sure hope you bring it back. Yes, ma'am. We'll try. Have you got any ideas as to what time the theft might have occurred? Well, near as I can figure, it must have been around midnight. Why do you say that? Well, I got home from work about 11.30. I'm a hostess in a restaurant downtown. Mm-hmm. Go on, please. Got home. The coat was still here. I hardly ever come into the house without checking on it. You know, it's the only real thing of value I got. Yes, ma'am. Well, there it was, hanging in the closet. I went out to have a cup of coffee and pick up the papers before I went to bed. Whoever took it must have been waiting outside. He saw me leave and then came in. What did he say, he? Hmm? Well, you said he must have been waiting. Oh, I didn't mean anything special. You know, just a word. I see. Did you see anybody in the vicinity when you left the house? No. Not that I can tell about now. The corner's a pretty busy place, Sergeant. Lots of people around there. A couple of restaurants. Always a lot of people around. I wonder if we could see how they got in, please. Yeah, I'm right back here. Here, you see, they cut the screen on the porch door and then just reached in and opened it. Mm-hmm. Top half of the door. You had it like this, did you? Yeah, you see, you just put these two little things and the glass part of the door comes out. Always take it out on warm nights. Anything else in the apartment disturbed? Not that I could tell. Seems that they just went into the bedroom and took the coat. That and the watch and the other stuff. But it's the coat that's important. Yes, I understand. I mean, coat means something special to a girl. I told you it took me three years of saving before I could buy it. It's a long time to do without things, Sergeant. An awful long time. Yes, ma'am. Now we had the coat three days, and this happens. Just three days. Hardly even had a chance to wear it. Is the coat insured? I think so. Ma'am? Well, I just got it. I think it's insured. I have to check with a salesman. I, I told him I wanted the coat covered. Boy, I just hope it's in effect. Beautiful coat. Just beautiful. Silver blue. Cost me almost $4,000. Come right down to it. That's about $1,000 a day. We have the serial number here for the watch. Now, is there any way you could identify the coat for us? Certainly. All I have to do is look at it. I can tell. Well, yes, ma'am. But is there any mark, any type of label that would help us in identifying? Oh, yeah. I see what you mean. Well, there's the store label. You could tell by that. Oh, that's probably one of the first things that thieves will take off. Well, I suppose so. Well, there's my initials. 
They can't get those out. Ma'am? I got my initials on some of the pelts. Had it done when I got the coat. Had it marked right on the skins under the lining. My initials, J.A. You could be able to tell from that. Could you draw the initials for us? Yeah. Wait a minute. I'll get a piece of paper. Right here, Miss Anderson. You can use this. Oh, oh, thanks. Here's a pencil. Okay. Well, you see, it's sort of like this. J.A. Like that. Mm-hmm. Would you draw the coat and show us where the initials are? Sure. You see, here's the sleeve. Then the body part comes down like this. Mm-hmm. The hem's here, and the initials are right there. Mm-hmm. All right, Miss Anderson. This is exactly how the initials are. Oh, there goes the coffee. Can, can I give you a cup? No, no thanks. No. no, thanks. Well, excuse me a minute, huh? Yes, ma'am. Do you really think you're going to get it back? Well, we're going to try. Did the men who were here last night get any clues? Beg your pardon? The men who were here last night, did they find anything that had helped? Not a great deal, no, ma'am. Well, I sure hope they find my coat. I just hate to think about it. What's that, ma'am? All that time. Three years working to save for a coat. Then just to have it three days. You know how the models in the magazines kind of drag a mink coat along the ground? You know, sort of over their shoulders? Yes, ma'am, I guess so. Well, I just had it three days, you know. Yeah. I didn't even learn how to do that. Reports of similar burglaries had been coming into the office for the past six weeks. In each one, the method of operation was similar enough to let us know that we were dealing with the same thieves. All of the homes that were prowled were residences. The owners of the houses were always absent. Entrance to the places was made through a rear window. In those cases where the window was open, the screen was cut. Where the window was locked, the pane of glass was broken, and the entrance made that way. The classification of goods stolen was also the same in all of the burglaries. Pieces of jewelry, whatever money was found, and fur coats. The only room prowled was the one where the fur coats were kept. None of the valuables in the rest of the house would be touched. Bulletins had been gotten out to all of the pawn shops in the area on the stolen pieces, but there'd been no replies. The M.O. had been checked with the staff's office, and the possibles that they came up with were checked out. We failed to come up with a suspect. The investigation of the crime lab on the scene had produced no tangible evidence. Frank and I had gone over the burglary reports time and time again, trying to find something that would tie the thefts together. None of the victims were acquainted with each other. They all lived in different parts of the city. The coats were bought from different retailers, and yet within a week of the time the coat was purchased, it would be stolen. Friends of the victims were checked. In most instances, we found that they didn't even know the victim had been in possession of the article stolen. On the night of May 6th, another burglary was reported. Among the stolen articles were a mink stole and a full-length natural mink coat. The coat had been purchased only three days before the theft. The victim had worn it in public only twice. After going over the physical evidence at the scene and talking with the woman, we were no further than we had been. Saturday, May 11th. Frank and I checked into the office. Another one that doesn't go any place. Yeah, you want to get the reports out? Yeah. You know, Joe, there's got to be something to tie them all together, something in common. Well, if we come up with that, maybe we got the answer. You see the bunch down at Chief Brown's office when we came in? Yeah. I recognize one of them. Yeah, who? Insurance man. I'll most likely be down here when we get through talking to Chief Brown. What's the figure the thefts have cost him? A little under $47,000. You know, you stand that kind of loss, you'd do some yelling too, wouldn't you? I suppose. Funny now the stuff's turned up. Well, it isn't doing them any good unless they sell it. I get it. Burglary Friday. Yeah, it is. Mm Mm-hmm. What's your name? What? No, where are you now? Mm Mm-hmm. All right. No, we'll be right over. Right. Well, maybe we got one. Yeah? Woman. Says she wants to talk to us about a stolen fur coat. The woman gave the name of Wilda Chandler. She said that she had some information for us and asked us to meet her in a bar at the corner of St. Andrew's Place and Las Palmas Avenue. It took us 23 minutes to get there. See her? No, we'd better ask the bartender. Yeah. Yeah? Is there a Miss Chandler here? Chandler? That's right. She just called. Said to meet her here. Might be her in the back booth. Didn't give no name. Back booth. Thank you. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? If it's her or your friend, will you do me a favor? What's that? Try to get her out of here. What do you mean? Get her out of here. All she's been doing is sitting back there playing that song. Playing the song, ordering doubles. We ain't got a girl in here this time of the morning. I gotta carry the orders back to her. Got a lot of other stuff to do. All right, we'll see about it. Well, if you can't get her out, at least talk her into sitting up here at the bar so I don't have to walk, huh? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Miss Chandler? Sit right on, boy. Been expecting you. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. I just bet you. Glad to meet both of you. Talked to you on the phone, didn't I? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'll never forget a name. How about a drink for you two boys? No, ma'am. Thank you. 
should have a couple. Seems to make everything a lot better. I may have several more. You said something about some information on some stolen fur coats, is that right? Yeah, and I got it. Old Max, he's going to be sorry. Old Max? Hear that on the jukebox? Melancholy mood. Here? Yes, ma'am. Our song. Is that right? You just betcha. Old Max, our song. Partner that goes, gone is every joy and inspiration. Tears are all I have to show. No consolation. So old Max left me. Tears in his fur coat. Uh-huh. Who's Max? You probably sure you don't want to drink? No, ma'am. No, Max. Just the tears in the coat. See? This is it. What do you think of it? It's very pretty. Well, that's a lie. It's a lousy coat and you know it. You want to tell us about the stolen coats, please? Yeah, I've been working for Max almost two months and I just found out. Guess you think that's pretty dumb, huh? Well, maybe if you tell us about it. Two months. Matter of fact, I just got the message last night, Friday, May 10th, 1.22 a.m., if you want to be exact. That's when I got the message about old Max. Now, look, miss, you called us and said that you had some information on some coats, and I wonder if you'd be kind enough to tell us about you it. just betcha. Would you put this in the jukebox for me? Play number B7, huh? Yes, sir. B7, huh? Yeah, melancholy mood. Oh, Max and my song. You know what? He's a no good. A real no good. This Max, has he got something to do with the burglaries? You just bet you. Old slick Max, he's a pistol. Yeah. Say, how about a drink? No, thank you. I didn't mean for you, for me. Suppose you tell us about Max and the furs, would you please? If that's the way you want it. Max is a thief. That's right. Well, you know him? I don't know. A thief. Worked for him two months, even thinking about marrying him. All the time, he's a thief. What's Max's last name? Barrett. Well, thanks for playing the song. It's real nice. That's B7. What about this Max? Tell me how I was going to wear mink, and this is what I end up with. Now, look, Miss Chandler, if you have some information for us, we want to hear it. But we haven't got time to sit here and keep you company. You think it's all a gag, huh? You just think I'm lonely, so I called you. That's what you think, isn't it? Why don't you tell us? Well, it isn't a gag. I can tell you all about the coats, all about them. Yes, ma'am, that's why we're here. Would you go ahead? Well, I'm a hat checker on a restaurant out in the country. It's a good racket. Got the job about three months ago. Doing real well at it. Then I meet this Max two months ago. Old Max walks in. Yes, ma'am. Gives me the big pitch. Now he thinks I'm so pretty, all that kind of stuff, you know? Go ahead. Well, he really piles it on. Now he's got a big deal cooking, and as soon as it comes through, him and me is going to get married. Tells me that while he's waiting for the deal to gel, he's selling insurance. Old Max selling insurance. Pretty funny, huh? Mm. Well, he tells me that the hardest thing about selling insurance is the contacts. You know, getting to meet the people who need it. Contacts. Yeah. And that's where I come in. You see, old Max, he doesn't sell insurance on people, not like on their lives. He doesn't sell that kind. Mm -hmm. He sells what they call uh, personal property insurance on things like rings and coats, stuff like that. You with me? Yes, ma'am, so far. Go ahead. Well, he tells me that if I'll help him with his contacts, he'll cut me on his percentage. He says all I have to do is tell him when some woman comes in with a new coat. It's her name and address, and you will go see her and make the sale. It's me simple. All i got to do is get the names and addresses. Did you do it? Sure. How dumb can you get? I gave him the names and addresses. I know there was anything wrong. Can you tell us what names you gave him? I got every one of them. Got them at home. You can have them. Why'd you find out he wasn't an insurance salesman? Last night, 1.22 a.m., I wasn't feeling so good, so I took off from work. Went by his place. Old Max was just coming in. Got the car parked out by his garage. The backseat is loaded with fur coats, all kind of other stuff. Watches, jewelry. That's when I knew he was a no good. Old Max, a pistol, a real no good. Yes, ma'am. What happened? Well, I asked him about the stuff, where he got it. Yeah? He told me all about it. How he'd been stealing. How all the names I'd been giving him were his sucker list. How as soon as I'd given the information, he'd lift the stuff. All that time... Two months, and I figured he was an insurance salesman. You know what he's doing with the coats? What? Well, is he selling them? Sure. He's got a regular order business. You call up and order a blue mink coat. If you want a platinum stole, just call Max. You'll have it. Is he disposing of it here in L.A.? <laughs> Not old Max. He's too smart for that. Ships the stuff east. Is that right? Didn't I just tell you it was? You just betcha. Max gets an order, and he goes out and he sells it. Then he gets a hold of some young kid and offers him a trip to the east. Maybe Chicago, Detroit, New York... Wherever the delivery is supposed to be made. Gives the kid a plane ticket and sends him on the way. The carrier know what he's doing? Oh, no. Max just gives him a suitcase and tells him where to deliver it. How'd you find out about the operation set up? Old Max, he told me. 
Said that since I found out, he'd have to cut me in. Give me all the scoop. Barrett ever been arrested? I don't know, maybe. You any close friends in town, do you know? I guess. Never saw none of them myself. You want to show us where he lives? Sure. I want to see him get his. After the way he lied. Ain't nothing too bad for him. Oh, Max, a pistol. He sell all the stolen goods? What do you mean? Well, do you know where the stolen coats are and the rest of the things? Must be in his apartment. Can't think of any other place it'd be. Gotta be there. Do you know if he's there now? He should be. He don't ever get up before noon. Should be there. I just want to see you get him. Lousiest trick in the world what he did to me. Yeah, what's that? Oh, that time him stealing those coats. All that beautiful mink. Look at this. Yes, ma'am. That's a very pretty coat. I thought so, too. Take a close look. Old Max gave it to me to show he was on the level. Take a good look. Yeah? All that mink, and he gives me rabbit. Before we left the bar, we put in a call to R&I asking if Max Barrett had a police record. The office told us that there was none in our files. We asked that a teletype be sent to George Brereton at the CII office up in Sacramento. We also had the name Wilda Chandler checked. She had no record in Los Angeles. 11.20 a.m., we got Barrett's address from the Chandler woman, and then we called a radio car. The officers took her to the city hall where she could make a full statement. Frank and I drove over to Barrett's apartment. Wilda Chandler had told us that the suspect drove a late model Pontiac sedan. We found the car parked in the garage in the rear of Barrett's address. A preliminary search of the garage and of the car failed to turn up any evidence of the thefts. 11.46 a.m., Frank and I went up to see Barrett. I'll get it. Mm-hmm. Probably still asleep. Uh-huh. Who is it? I'd like to see you. Just a minute. Yeah? You Max Barrett? Yeah, who are you guys? What do you want? Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. Get out of here. Hold it, Mr. All right, come on, on your feet, Barrett. What's this is all about, anyway? What are you guys doing breaking in here like this? You want to check the closets, Frank? Right. You got no right to come in here and do this. What are you looking for? I got nothing to hide. You didn't act that way when we came in, did you? How did I know you were real cops? You read all the time in the papers how guys say they're cops and then break in and rob people. That's what I thought you were. Call me cops. We showed you our identification, didn't we? Well, how did I know it was real? I've never been mixed up with the law before. How did I know you were really cops? How about it? The place is clean. Sure, it's clean. What'd you expect to find? Right, come on, get dressed. We're taking you downtown. For what? We want to talk to you. You ain't talking. You got to do do it here. I'm not going any place with you. You just keep believing that, Mister. Now get your clothes on. Come what on. What are you arresting me for? Suspicion of burglary. Are you serious? Get dressed. Okay, you take me in, book me. But you're going to be in real trouble, cop, because there's one big problem. Yeah. You can't prove it. Twelve ten p.m. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout on Barrett's apartment in the event any of his associates contacted him. We asked his landlady about his friends. She told us that as far as she knew, the suspect was an insurance salesman. She said that he told her that because of his type of business, it would be necessary for him to keep late hours and that he didn't want to be disturbed during the day. We searched his apartment and his garage, but we were unable to turn up any of the stolen merchandise. We took him down to the city hall and got off all station radiograms with special attention to the police departments in Chicago, Detroit, and New York, giving them descriptions of the suspect and of the stolen property. We asked that their pawn shop details check the outlets in their cities. 3.15 3.15 p.m. We had Barrett brought to the city hall, and we talked to him in the squad room. Okay, you made the boo-boo. Now, how are you going to get out of it? What do you mean? Well, you've had the chance to check my record. You know I'm clean. How are you going to get out of having me sue you? You got a job. Yeah? Where do you work? I'm an insurance salesman. What's the name of your company? What do you want that for? We want to talk to them. I don't want you calling them. They find out I'm down here. Before I get a chance to tell them about it, I'll lose my job. You kind of got this thing a little mixed up, haven't you? What do you mean? You've been trying to sell us how innocent you are all morning. Yet every time we ask a question, you give us a smart answer. Now, if you haven't got anything to hide, why don't you come off it and tell us the truth for a change? I'm doing that. When? What company you work for? I'm not going to tell you. This rate book we found in your car. This the one? Great Southwestern Life, that it? Why don't you call them and find out? We did. They say they never heard of you. Then it isn't them, is it? What are you doing with a rate book? That illegal, too? Where'd you get it? friend of mine. I like to check the prices of other companies, keep abreast of things. What's the friend's name? You know I'm not going to give you that. Hey, who put you on to me anyway? You said it yourself. We're not going to tell you. But it was that Wilda brought. Who? Who's playing cozy now? Wilda Chandler. She's the one who told you to pick me up, isn't she? Does she have a reason to do that? She might think so. Why don't you tell us about it? I tried to help her out, give her the chance to earn some extra money. Told her I'd give her five bucks for every prospect she turned over to me who bought some insurance. And it worked good for a while. And she started boozing it up. Got to be a real lush. Couldn't trust her anymore. 
She was giving me a list of bad names, making them up. I had to get rid of her. No. Give her a coat and called it quits. How about these names she gave you? You got a copy of them? No. Turned out they weren't any good, so I threw them away. Frank? Yeah, you got that list. Yeah, here you go. Listen to these. See if they sound like the people Wilda told you about. Pauline Manel, Myrtle Briggs, Mrs. Mildred Carlson, Miss Jane Anderson, Alice Beckworth. How about it? Do you recognize any of them? She's the one, isn't she? Lousy bus. She's the one who told you, isn't she? Recognize the names? Yeah. Every one of those people have had a burglary in their house in the last month. There's a lot more names. Why don't you cop out and tell us the truth? I got nothing to say until I see a lawyer. Joe, see you a minute. Yeah, Olson, right away. What do you got? Kid says his name's Jim Nelson. Picked him up out at Barrett's place. Anything on him? Suitcase. Here it is. A couple of fur coats inside him. What about Nelson? Checked him. Got a record. Listen to burglary arrest. One conviction. Where's he now? Got him over in an interrogation room. Who's with him? Rubles. Any trouble? No. Walked in and we took him. Says he wants to see Barrett. Thought maybe you'd want to talk to him first. Yeah, I do. We'll be right back, Frank. Okay. Let's go. Anything on the coat? Haven't had a chance to check him yet. Brought the Nelson kid right in. Anybody out at Barrett's now? Yeah, we called the team before we left. Okay, thanks. I'll call you. Right. Hi, Rubles. Thanks. All right. Olsen, I'll be down the hall if you need anything, Joe. Right, thank you. Your name Nelson, is that right? Yeah. Where'd you get the suitcase? Barrett gave it to me. When? A couple of days ago. I was supposed to take it to Detroit. What happened? I didn't make it. Got to thinking about how he was willing to pay my expenses back there just to take the suitcase. Got to wondering what was so important. Opened the suitcase, and when I saw what was in it, I didn't want any part of it. Tried to give it back to him. Cops picked me up. Uh-huh. You know where he got the coat? No, I don't want to. Anytime a guy's willing to pay expenses back, he's just to deliver a suitcase. There's something phony about it. I want no part of the action. You know I got a record. I only stood one conviction. I'm trying to keep clean. You got Barrett here now? That's right. You gonna hold him? Yeah. I'd like to see him for a minute. Why? I'd like to tell him what I thought about the deal he tried to pull. Telling me how he was my friend. All the time getting me to carry the stuff for him. Can you fix it up so I can see him? Yeah. Come on. You gonna be able to nail him? We will now. You imagine a guy would pull a stunt like that on his friends? A guy would do that do about anything. Well, yeah. you willing to testify about how Barrett gave you the suitcase? I sure am. I want to see him nailed good. Barrett? Yeah? Turn around here. This friend of yours wants to see you. What are you doing here? Thought I'd be in Detroit by now, didn't you, Max? Just keep your mouth shut. They got nothing on us. Watch him while I get the suitcase for you. Yeah. You ever see this bag before, Barrett? He should. He gave it to me. Beautiful coat here. Let's take a look at the lining, shall we? I don't know anything about those. The guy sold them to me. I don't know where they came from. How about it? It's right there. Initials J.A. You want to tell us now, Barrett? Barrett? Lousy kid, I should have known better than right, that. You. Come on, let him go. Let him go. Bust his nuts. Sit down, Bowie. Sit down, Barry. Oh, kid. It's going good until he stuck his nose into it. All going good. How lousy can a deal get? Well, I wouldn't worry about it. What? You're going to find out. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 18th, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Max Rudolph Barrett was tried and convicted of burglary in the first degree, four counts, and received sentence as prescribed by law. Burglary in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than five years. His associates in the burglary ring were tried and convicted of receiving stolen property, which is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not more than ten years. Because of the cooperation she gave authorities in apprehending the suspects, Wilda Noreen Chandler was released from custody. Dragnet is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
gentlemen, the material and direct quotations included in the following program have been taken from authoritative files and from dispatches filed by the Associated Press and International News Service. We present these statements without editorial comment. We assume no responsibility for their content. The American Broadcasting Company presents One Out of Seven. make a day. Seven days make one week. And from these past seven days, the editors here in our San Francisco newsroom have chosen the one story which they have judged most worthy of retelling. This is One Out of Seven. Theodore Gilmore Bilbo is an honorable man. As a member of the United States Senate, he is looked upon as such by the eyes of the law. Perhaps he is looked upon as such by many or most of his constituents. Though his voice occasionally grate upon the nerves, and his views often confound the innocent, the fact remains, as a member of the Senate of the United States, Theodore Gilmore Bilbo is an honorable man. And we do not intend to prove otherwise. We merely wish to cite a few samples of his handiwork, and perhaps a supplementary side glance or two, just for the sake of contrast. Adjust your dials most carefully, citizens. Herewith presenting Senator Theodore Bilbo, picture number one. <laughs> The Chamber of the Mississippi State Legislature. Time, March 23rd, 1944. The Speaker. The Chair recognizes us distinguished guests, the Honorable Theodore Bilbo, United States Senator from the State of Mississippi. Jump. At this moment, I cannot urge you too strongly to continue the valiant fight to uphold our racial integrity. We must renew our faith and allegiance to the color line. For your information, I have found that certain Negro organizations are determined to secure passage of anti-poll tax measures. It's their first wedge toward the fulfillment of a dastardly equality program which Negro leaders have launched throughout the South and throughout the nation. That equality they must not and will not attain. After his stirring appeal to the legislature, Senator Bilbo informs a small group of friends in confidential tones you know, gentlemen, I, I found out that a prominent uh, national official asked uh, southern colleges and universities to open their doors to Negroes. You know what I told them? Well, I'll tell you what I told them. I told them, I said, Negroes are never getting into our universities. You Negro-loving Yankees can go straight... As a member of the Senate of the United States, Theodore Bilbo is an honorable man. And we do not intend to prove otherwise. Here is picture number two. Hello. Senator Bilbo speaking. Senator, this is Representative Mark Antonio of New York speaking. Yes, yes. What do you want? Senator, I just got a letter from a lady who lives in my district. Uh, it seems that she wrote you that letter about your filibustering against the FEPC. Well, she says she stated her case fairly. And uh, she also says that as a reply, you wrote her one of the dirtiest letters possible. <laughs> well, yes, I, I think I did. Well, Senator, she also says you addressed her with a greeting, My dear Dago. Is that correct? Of course that's correct. That's what I call her. She's a wop, ain't she? That lady's Italian, Senator. 
Yeah, that's what you mean. I just thought you'd like to know that the lady has three brothers in the army in Europe. One of them has been killed in action already. You know, if you had a shred of decency in you, you'd apologize for that letter. I'll never apologize why she's getting off light. Now listen, she really would have been scorched if I was mad. Theodore Bilbo is an honorable man. We do not intend to prove otherwise. Here is picture number three. Scene. The chamber of the United States Senate. Time, the 30th of June, 1945. Senator Bilbo is filibustering against passage of the Fair Employment Practices Commission. And during his prolonged dissertation to the gentlemen of the Senate... The following occurs. The senator from Mississippi may continue. Thank you. Gentlemen, I have been hearing much talk about the supposed bravery of our Negro soldiers. I have it on good authority and from some of the highest ranking generals in our army that our Negro troops overseas are an utter and abysmal failure. They're just no good. And as for giving them a vote, why, they'd only sell their votes to the highest bidder anyway. So why give it to them in the first place? At the same moment, deep in the jungle of an embattled Pacific island... A Negro soldier pens a note back home to his family. And maybe this works pretty hard, Margaret. But it's a job that you just have to do. It's been three days now. I've got no sleep. Their bombers are still paying us visits. And it still doesn't look like the war is going to be over soon. But we have to keep on. Just keep on. I know. I just know everything's going to turn out all right. But when we finally get back, the folks will realize what we've done. And I'll bet they look at us differently. You know, for the first time, they'll see that bullets can kill anybody. They'll see, black or white, when blood runs out on the ground. It's all the same color. That's what the Negro G.I. thought. But back in the chamber of the United States Senate, Theodore Bilbo thought differently. I have it on good authority, and from some of the highest ranking generals in our army that our Negro troops overseas are an utter and abysmal failure. When Senator Bilbo made that statement, he was standing under the roof of the United States Senate. It is very safe in the United States Senate. A bomb hasn't fallen there for quite some time. <laughs> An interesting portrait of a duly elected representative of the American people. For you see, Theodore Bilbo is an honorable man. And we do not wish or intend to prove otherwise. Here is picture number four. Though the senator has firm convictions on certain subjects, there is seen a mounting tide of sentiment equally firm, equally convinced that the senator errs. On the 10th of August, 1940. Senator Bilbo. It is the opinion of the Committee of Catholics for Human Rights that your conduct toward racial minorities is a chilling deterrent to worldwide belief that America is the symbol of democratic freedom and human rights. In a recent statement to the press, you attacked the Jewish people of the United States on the grounds that their race had damned and crucified Christ. You used this highly metaphysical argument 
to damn, vilify, besmirch, and otherwise persecute the Jewish people in America to further your own political ends. By lucid contrast, a few days after his attack on the Jews, Senator Bilbo is stricken suddenly with a strange ailment. He is put aboard a train and speeds northward for treatment. And is it not strange that the senator demands to be taken to the Mayo Clinic? Is it not strange when you consider that the Mayo Clinic was founded and operated by the Mayo Brothers, two members of the Jewish race professing the Jewish faith? Obviously, the senator is not loath to take advantage of the skill of the Jewish race. In the end, the senator's critical operation is a success. And in a few weeks, he returns to the floor of the Senate with another plan for the American Negroes. Gentlemen, for the best interest of the nation and all concerned, I believe a colony for American Negroes should be established on the west coast of Africa, bordering the state of Monrovia. Because of the exigencies of the times, any Negro who is race conscious and smart should be ready and more than willing to settle down in such a colony in West Africa. <laughs> very same day in the halls of the Senate, hallowed by the figures of men the likes of Lincoln and Jefferson, Theodore Bilbo, as a representative of the American people, had this to say. I cannot vote for the appointment of Mrs. Franklin Roosevelt as delegate to the United Nations Organization for the United States. No. She is a woman who has professed friendship for the Negro elements in America. She has no place representing us abroad. Chair recognizes the senator from Idaho. Mr. President, I should like to congratulate the senator from Mississippi. He doesn't know it, but he just paid a splendid compliment to Mrs. Roosevelt by voting against her. <laughs> Mr. President, gentlemen, please, please, I'd like to add one more note. A word of warning to our senator from the South. It isn't going to be long now, Senator, before the people of Mississippi see the light and knock you out of office on that part of your anatomy where your few brains are undoubtedly located. You must understand, please, this was merely a portrait, an interesting portrait of a representative of the American people, for, after all... Senator Theodore Gilmore Bilbo is an honorable man. He is looked upon as such by the eyes of the law. He is an honorable man. We did not intend to prove otherwise. One Out of Seven is written by James Edward Moser. Gil Dowd is the producer and music by Otto Clare at the Hammond Organ. The material used in tonight's program was taken from authoritative files and from dispatches by Associated Press and International News Service. Listen next week, same time, same station, for One Out of Seven. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Lickett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. You get a call from an informant telling you that three known gangsters have moved into your city. You don't know who they are or why they're in Los Angeles. Your job, check them out. 
To sell a product, you have to make it good and keep it good. What do the latest reports show about Chesterfield? Well, our research laboratory has compared it with the leading cigarettes in the country. Chesterfield is highest in quality, low in nicotine. Another good reason why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular or king size, you will find Chesterfield really mild, really satisfying. Best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, August 4th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Stad Brown. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 9.42 a.m. when we got to the Osborne Turkish Bath. Steam room. Hot, isn't it? Yeah. Must be Dell back there. Yeah. Dell? Yeah, who is it? It's Friday and Smith. Oh, I'll be right with you. Okay. Hey, Joe, did you ever have one of these? One of what? Turkey's baths. Ever had one? No, no, I never have. I understand they're great for colds. You just sit there and it burns the germs right out. It's great. You ever have one? No, but Armin, my brother in law, he takes them all the time. Tells me about how it does for colds. Next time he has one, I think I'll go with him. Yeah, it's a good idea. Ah, sorry to keep you waiting. We've been having trouble with the boiler. Got to keep a close check on the steam pressure in here. That's okay. Let's get out of here, huh? Well, it won't make me unhappy. It sure is hot, Dell. Come on upstairs. We can talk there. Okay. What do you got for us, Dell? I uh, might not go any place, but I thought I ought to fill you guys in on it. Mm-hmm. Car rolled in here last night. Must have been about 10.30. Night man's out with a cold, so I had to fill in. A cold? Yeah, some kind of virus or something. Oh, yeah. Come on, we can talk in the office. Sit down, you. Mind if I go over some of these bills while we talk? No, go ahead. Well, uh, this bimbo pulls in here last night, really carrying a load. I registered him and had Jimmy take him upstairs. Guy's kind of loud, you know, rolling all over the place. I wanted to get him upstairs to a room, figuring he'd sack out and we wouldn't hear no more from him. No. Well, he had a different idea. A couple minutes later, he comes downstairs, wants to know what's going on. What do you mean? Wants to know where the steam room is. Says he's not going to sit in the little room all night. He paid for a steam bath. That's what he wants. Yeah. When he starts to talk about his high-powered friends and this dealer out pull, I kind of figure there's something wrong. He tell you who the friends were? No, not right now. Just mentioned a guy named Bud. Kept talking how Bud was going to be sore at him because he got drunk. Must have said it a hundred times. How Bud was going to be real sore. Sounded to me like this Bud is the big man in the deal. I see. No idea what the deal is, though, huh? No, most he said was that when they left town, they were all going to have a lot of money. More money than I'd ever seen. You got the name on this guy? Oh, here's the register here. Let's see. Hey, you can see right here. Uh, uh-huh. Vernon Carmichael, Los Angeles. Didn't give an address, huh? Well, once he mentioned he had to meet Bud at a hotel down on South Flower. Didn't say which one, though. Well, Flower's a long street, Dell. That doesn't help much. Didn't give any ideas at all of what the deal was going to be, huh? No, it must be a good one, though. Why do you say that? Well, when I took him up to his room last night, I could see his clothes hanging on a chair. Yeah. On top of his coat, he had a shoulder holster. Looked like a forty-five automatic in it. The way I look at it, the guy that's carrying that kind of muscle is figuring on scoring heavy. Did you make any phone calls while he was here? No. Anybody had the room since he left? No, I told the cleanup man to leave it alone. Figure you'd want to go over it. That's a good idea. What time did he leave this morning? Jimmy says it was about 7.30. I figured sure he'd sleep most of the morning. If I'd have known he was going to leave that early, I'd have called you last night. Mm-hmm. Well, we better take a look at that room, Dell. Might be able to come up with something that'll tell us who he is. I got something else for you. Yeah, what's that? I mentioned this Carmichael to Jimmy last night. Told him that I thought there was something wrong. Yeah. The reason the guy left so early is that he got a call from somebody. Guess it's the guy that picked him up. Did this Jimmy see who it was? No, did the next best thing, though. Yeah, what's that? Got the license number of the car. Ten fifteen a.m. We got in touch with Leighton Prince and Harlan Stahl sent a crew out to go over the room. Frank put in a call to the record bureau, and he had the name Vernon Carmichael checked. There was no record on anyone answering the description that we'd gotten from the manager of the Turkish bands. In addition, a radiogram was sent to the Department of Motor Vehicles in Pennsylvania, 
asking for all available information on the owner of the car bearing the license number that we've been given. 11.30 a.m. Harlan Stahl's crew finished checking the room, and they told us that they'd been able to lift a complete set of clean fingerprints from a water glass. They were photographed and classified. In checking our files, there was no record of the prints. They were forwarded to George Breton up at Sacramento to CII and to the FBI in Washington, D.C. Two days passed. On Friday, August 6th, we got the word from DMV in Pennsylvania that the car was registered to a Howard Nielsen. The radiogram also gave us a description of the car and the registered owner's address in Pittsburgh. On receipt of this information, we got in touch with the police department in Pittsburgh and found that Howard Bud Nielsen had a misdemeanor record. Late Friday afternoon, the kickback from Washington, D.C. arrived with the information that the fingerprints found in the room at the Turkish bath were those of Vernon Carmichael. His record listed arrests for petty theft and robbery in Pennsylvania. He'd been brought to trial, but he'd been acquitted. Both men were well known to the police department in Pittsburgh as hoodlums. On Saturday morning, the mugshots of both Nielsen and Carmichael arrived. 10.15 a.m., we met with Lieutenant Jack Smyers, and we decided that the information coupled with the records of the two men made the incident worth investigation. The mugshots of the pair were copied, and a canvas of the hotels on South Flower Street was started in an attempt to find the residence of the suspects. The search went on for another two days without results. Monday, August 9th, 11.47 a.m., Frank and I got back to the office from communications. You know, we're going to feel pretty silly if Carmichael and Nielsen are already back there. Yeah, I know. It's beginning to look like the tip from Dell about the hotel on Flower was off, huh? Yeah. Still a lot of places to check, though. Friday? Yeah. yeah. We got it for you. What? Carmichael and Nielsen. We found the hotel. At 10.30 that morning, officers Murphy and Rafferty had gotten the first affirmative answer to their questions about the suspects. A room clerk in a small hotel at the corner of South Flower Street and Bunker Hill Avenue had recognized the mugshots of Carmichael and Nielsen. Further questioning brought out the name of the third man in the trio. He was identified as Ernest Hunter. A check of the name through our records netted us no new information on him, and the name in the description was forwarded again to Brereton up at CII in Sacramento and again to Pittsburgh for possible identification. In talks with Lieutenant Smyers and Chief of Detectives Thad Brown, it was decided to keep the man under 24-hour surveillance. Three additional teams of men from robbery detail were assigned to the duty. For the next seven days, the three men were under constant watch. Their habits were regular, their movements during the day followed the same general pattern. The kickback on Ernest Hunter disclosed no criminal record. At the end of the first week of watching the men, it was decided that the next step in the operation was to place a microphone in their room so that we might be able to monitor their conversations. Frank and I got in touch with the sound crew at the crime lab, and we made arrangements for them. The necessary permits were obtained from the Federal Communications Commission, and the listening equipment itself was ready. We made arrangements with radio car officers to pick up the suspects for investigation. The sound crew, Frank and I, along with Murphy and Rafferty, stood by for word that the trio was in custody. Tuesday night, 9.40 p.m. Should be getting word pretty quick. Yeah. Red 2 to Red 1. Red 2 to Red 1. Come in, Red 1. That's Murph. Yeah. Red 1 to Red 2. Come in, Red 2. Any word yet? Over. No, not yet. We're all set. The manager's apartment. Monitor to outpost 1. Monitor to outpost 1. Come in, outpost 1. Sounds like they got him. Yeah, you want to take it? Yeah. Stand by, Red 3. Outpost 1 to monitor. Outpost 1 to monitor. Go ahead. Monitor to outpost 1. Information received that suspects are in custody. Repeat, suspects are in custody. Acknowledge. Outpost 1 to monitor. Outpost 1 to monitor. Message received. Outpost 1 up. You heard it. Now. Yeah. Red 1 to Red 2 and Red 3. Red 1 to Red 2 and Red 3. Do you read me, Red 2 and 3? Red 2 to Red 1. Read 2. Red 3 to Red 1. Receiving clearly. Red 1 to Red 3. Suspects are now in custody. Proceed with installation of listening equipment. Over. Red 3, please keep contact. Will do, Red 1. Red 3 out. Red 1 to Red 2. Come in, Red 2. Red 2 to Red 1. Murph, can you see the suspect's apartment from where you are? Not good, Joe. It's down the hall and around the corner. First door. Over. Red 1 to Red 3. Come in, Red 3. Red 3 to Red 1. Are you in the apartment yet? Yeah, Joe. We're just starting to install the bug. Is there a radio in the room? Yeah, a small table model. It's on the nightstand next to the bed. Can you fix that before you leave? Yeah, I'll pull one of the wires so it won't work. Good. 
Where are you putting the bug? We're landing under the edge of the carpet near the door to the kitchen. Should be able to pick up the whole room from there. Well, there's nothing to do now until we get it finished, huh? Yeah. We got the recorder all set up? Yeah, it's in the room. Sound crew came in this afternoon and made the installation on it. Mm-hmm. You know how to work it? Yeah, I think so. Jack checked me out on it. It's pretty simple. Just like playing the piano. Press a key and away it goes. Well, I hope you got it. I've always had trouble with them. Last time out, I wanted to rewind one of the spools and listen to something. Ended up erasing everything we yes, had. Yes, I remember that very well. I was afraid you would. Mm-hmm. Red three to red one. Red three to red one. Come in, red one. It's the sound crew. Yeah. Red one to red three. As completed installation, we're leaving the apartment. Have you seen anybody in the halls? No, all clear. We've had more than our share of luck on this one, Joe. Yeah, let's hope it holds out. p.m. The installation of the listening equipment was completed, and Frank and I, along with Officer Pat Murphy, took up our positions in the room we intended to use as a monitoring post. Officer Rafferty went back to the city hall and told them that we'd finished and we were ready to have the suspects released. In the meantime, Carmichael, Nielsen, and Hunter had been fingerprinted and mugged. A search of their persons had failed to reveal any incriminating evidence, and the time that they'd been held had allowed us to make the necessary installation. After the trio had been released, we received information that they were proceeding toward the hotel. Frank, Murphy, and I waited for them at the monitor post to come into their room. 12.35 a.m. That's them. Get the recorder, huh? Right. You want to take care of the log, Frank? Yeah. Let's see, it's 12.36 a.m. That's it. Lousy deal, boy. Just wanted to ask a few questions, that's all. That's what you think. They had a reason. You're so smart, you tell me why. Ah, shut up. Will you, Carmichael? You weren't such a big man when he started asking you the questions. You ought to thanks saying how he was going to cut them all. Why don't you shut up? Probably when you got cranked up for that Turkish bath, that's probably what tipped him. What tip? A couple of uniformed cops stopped us on a routine investigation. They got nothing. Anything on it? You think you'll let us go? Well, do you? You think you'll let us go? Oh, why don't you dry up? Hunter? Yeah? Turn on the radio, will you? Get some music. Yeah. And next time you get tanked, come back here. Uh, don't go rolling all over town. That's why they picked us up. You said something. What did I say? You know what I said, huh, do you? You being a big man, you tell me what I said to him. They picked me up. Go ahead, tell me. You said something. I don't know what it was, but you shut up your mouth. Hey, Hunter, what's the matter with the radio? I thought you'd start turning it up. I'm fine, see. Keep broken. Don't work. Uh, doesn't make any difference. Uh, it's a sack. I ain't gonna eat a for a while. You open your mouth anymore, you got more trouble you can handle. That's the way it looks to you. Yeah, duck. You guys don't shut up. I'm gonna throw one of you out of here. Now shut up and get some sleep. Good night. Good night. Still gonna be the radio on this. And that's the way it went for the next five days. When the men were in the room, they argued continually. They talked about the deal they were working on, but from their conversation, there was no way of learning what they planned. When they left the room, they were constantly under surveillance, but their movements were routine. They took their meals in the same restaurant. They went to movies. They sat in bars, always together. During the time they were out of the apartment, they made no local contacts. They received no telephone calls. They made none. We knew that they were planning something, but there was no way of knowing what it was. All conversation in the room was recorded and listened to over and over again in the hope that we could come up with some kind of a lead. But the time spent in replaying the recordings netted us nothing. From what they'd said, we figured that whatever they were planning would take place on either Tuesday, August 17th, or on Wednesday, August 18th. On Tuesday, three-way cars were assigned to the streets in front of the hotel, but the suspects acted as usual. On Wednesday, they didn't leave their room. Frank, Murphy, and I continued to wait. On the streets outside, three other teams of men were standing by in undercover cars. 9.30 p.m. That's their telephone. Get the recorder, Murph. Yeah. 9.31 p.m. Yeah. Units 1K89, 1K88, 1K87. Suspects are leaving room. Suspects are leaving room. Outpost 1 out. All right, let's go. I wish we knew what it was. Sounds like it might be narcotics. Well, it could be. Doesn't make a lot of difference, does it? Yeah. At least we know it's something. (laughs) 
By the time we got to the street, the suspects were getting into their car and pulling away from the curb. Frank Murphy and I got to our car and followed them. They drove down South Flower to the corner of Palm Drive and turned left. Three blocks further, they pulled into a gas station and apparently asked directions. They turned south on Broadway and drove about a mile. At Santa Barbara Avenue, they turned left again and drove three blocks. They stopped and parked the car in front of a small bar. We informed the other units of the activity and asked them to stand by in the area. Carmichael got out of the car and entered the bar. Murphy left us and entered the bar after him. Carmichael returned in a few minutes with another man. The two of them got back into the car and they talked. At the end of that time, all four of the men got out of the automobile and then they entered the bar. Shortly after that, Carmichael, Nielsen, and Hunter walked out of the place. Carmichael was carrying a small package wrapped in plain brown paper and tied with a string. The fourth man wasn't with him. Frank and I got out of our car and approached the men as they stood talking. All right, hold it up, police officers. Over there. Put your hands up on that wall. What's going on? Get your hands up there. Frank, you want to check in the package? Yeah. Keep your hands on that wall. Lousy deal. I hope you're happy, Carmichael. I hope you're real happy. What are you talking about? I've got to lay this one to you. You really took care of this. Stand still and keep quiet. How about it, Frank? I don't know. What do you mean? Where's money? $20 bills. Must be $15,000, $20,000 worth. Queer? As far as I can tell, it's good. Well, where's that put us? Well, there's $20,000 here. Yeah. Let's find out where they got it. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. There are good reasons why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Why Chesterfield is the largest selling two-way cigarette in America. Why Chesterfield is best for me and best for you. People these days want facts. When you want people to use your product, you have to tell them what effect it has on people who do use it regularly. That's why a doctor has examined for almost two years a large group of Chesterfield smokers. 45% of them have, on the average, been smoking Chesterfields for well over 10 years. What is the effect on these people from smoking Chesterfield? No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses, says the doctor. Consider Chesterfield's record with these smokers, with millions of other smokers throughout America. Another good reason for you to change to Chesterfield. Regular or king size, Chesterfield is best for me, best. For you. Ten oh two AM. The four suspects were taken into custody and removed to the city hall for interrogation. We got in touch with the Secret Service and asked them to come over to the office to check on the currency. The agent arrived and after looking at the money pointed out several minute mistakes that had been made in the engraving of the plates. He went on to explain, however, that this particular printing was one of the best that he'd ever seen. He told us that the paper used in the bills would be analyzed and that we'd receive copies of the reports as soon as they were finished. 12.14 a.m. While Murphy, Rafferty, and the Secret Service man questioned Nielsen in the interrogation room, Frank and I talked to Carmichael in the squad room. We questioned him for about an hour, but he refused to say anything that would help us get a lead to the source of the counterfeit. 1.30 a.m. How long do you figure you can keep this up, Carmichael? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, now, come off it. We're getting tired of playing kid games here. We want to know where the queer came from now. Who says it's queer? The guy that printed it was pretty sloppy. He made a lot of mistakes. <clears throat> Joe? Yeah, Mark. See you, man? Yeah. Be right back. Yeah. How you doing? Nothing. Nielsen won't say a word. Gives it to us that he didn't know what was going on. Says he just went out there to pick up a package. They say who they were running the errand for? No. Tells it just he went along for the ride. The whole thing was Carmichael's idea. Mm-hmm. We thought maybe we'd go to work on Hunter, see what we can get from him. Okay. You going to stick with Carmichael? Yeah, I guess so. From what we heard in the room, if there's going to be a break, I got a hunch it's going to come from him. Okay. You got anything, let us know, huh? Right away. Oh, big man's back again. Your friend there tell you all about it? No, but yours did. Hmm? Nielsen just laid the whole thing in your lap. You're kidding. So you want to talk to him? What'd he say? The way he tells it, he was just along for the ride. You're the big wheel in the whole thing. He said that? I said you could talk to him if you want to. Well, he ain't going to make it. He ain't going to lay it on me. You want to tell us your side of it? Yeah, I'll tell you the way it happened. That lousy bum. How do you like that, him saying I'm the wheel? I'll tell you. All right, now where'd the queer come from? I don't know. I thought you were going to tell us. I'm doing that. I really don't know where it came from. You turn up with $20,000 and $20 bills, and you ask us to believe that you don't know where it was printed. I'm not asking you anything. I'm telling you what I know. That's it. Well, tell us about your part. Nielsen, Hutter, and me were approached in Pittsburgh. By who? I don't know. We're going that way again, huh? I say you don't believe me. That's the way it happened. The guy who approached you, he just walked up and said, here's 20000 bucks, just like that, huh? No, the deal was that Nielsen, Hunter, and me were supposed to come out here. We were supposed to check into a hotel and wait for a call. The guy who called us would have the queer. 
He'd turn it over to us and we'd pass it. You bought the counterfeit? Yeah. What'd you pay for it? Two and a half. For $20? Yeah, two and a half for 20 You paid the other man we picked up? Yeah, we gave him 2500 bucks. You ever seen a man before? What? The man you bought the queer from. Do you know him? No, I never saw him before. He's not the man who made the original contact in Pittsburgh. No, a guy back east was an old man. How old? I don't know, maybe 55, 60, around in there. Not the fellow you met tonight. I told you that before. It's not the same man. You use a name of any kind? No. You just to call him Pop, that's all. Pop. Give us a description of this man, Pop. What's in it for me? Well, what do you got now? Nothing. All right, it'll stay that way. You're in big trouble, Carmichael. If you're smart at all, you're going to cop out the whole thing and cooperate with us. Lousy Nielsen. Him all the time yelling about how it was all set. All the time saying we had it made. Sure, I'll go with you. I just want to see Nielsen get his, that's all. Just want to see him get his. We're going to want you to look at some pictures, too. I told you I'd go the route. You just tell me what you want to know. If I got the answer, so have you. All right. What'd he tell you? What? That lousy Nielsen. What'd he tell you about how it happened? You tell you the way I did? You tell it that way? Pretty much, yeah. Sure, that's the way it happened. Can't be told any other way. Well, Nielsen might give you an argument there. Further interrogation of the other three men in the operation served to corroborate the story that we've been given by Carmichael. Twenty-five hundred dollars in cash was found on the fourth suspect. Once the other men were confronted with the fact that Carmichael had told us everything he knew concerning the operation, they all followed suit. But other than telling us that they knew the head man in the counterfeiting act as Pop, they couldn't come up with any further information. From the man who'd been in the bar, we learned that he'd met Pop in Pittsburgh. He also told us that as far as he knew, the counterfeiter had been in prison at one time or another. However, the suspect was unable to tell us in what state or on what charges Pop had served time. He went on to tell us that he'd gotten the money in Pittsburgh and that Pop had told him that he'd be contacted later. The Secret Service had completed their analysis of the counterfeit bills and they told us that they were some of the most perfect printing jobs that they'd run across. The counterfeiter had made one major mistake, however. In the printing of the currency, he'd impregnated the paper with small silken hairs so that it would stand close inspection. The currency now in use is made with nylon hairs. The agent from the Secret Service told us that they had agents working on tracing the manufacturer of the paper in the hopes that they could come up with a lead as to the identity of Pop. The four suspects were booked into the city jail. Thursday, August 19th, we ran the name Pop through our moniker file. Of the 47 cards turned over to us by the record bureau, 19 of the suspects listed matched the descriptions that we've been given. The pictures of the men were pulled and shown to Carmichael and the other three suspects. They were unable to give us an identification. The name and description was sent to George Brereton in Sacramento, and he sent us another 150 possible. These were checked out without result. The nickname and physical description of the man was sent to Washington, and we got back over a thousand names and pictures. It took us six weeks working with the Secret Service to check out these possibles. The results, nothing. Tuesday, October 5th, Frank and I got back to the office. I get it. Robbery Friday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, wait a minute. Wait till I get that down. All right, go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, well, it should check out. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, we'll meet you. What you got? Report of the paper and the queer bills just came through. Yeah. Looks like we found Pop. In checking the manufacturers of paper similar to that used in the counterfeit $20 bills, the Secret Service had come up with the name of a small print shop in the eastern section of Los Angeles. The paper used was of an unusual type, and there were not many orders for it. This particular shop had ordered large quantities of it in the past and was continuing to use it. In checking out the name of the man on the order blanks, the Secret Service had found that he'd been convicted of robbery and had served a term in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. He'd been released and had come to California and opened a small print shop. We spent the next two days checking the suspect out. His name was given as Stanley Jackson, age 47. For the next week, the print shop and Jackson himself were kept under constant surveillance. On Thursday, October 14th at 11.50 p.m., the suspect was followed to his print shop. I'll cover the front of the shop, Joe. Right, mate. Come on, Frank. Yeah. Joe? Yeah. Sounds like a press, doesn't it? Yeah, come on. The back door is around here. You see what's going on in there? No. Got the windows all painted over. Hmm. What do you think? Well, it doesn't leave us with a lot of choice. If we go in and he's not printing counterfeit, we're going to make him so hinky that we might never nail him. Yeah. If we don't go in, he might get rid of the place and we're in trouble there, too. Yeah, like I said, we haven't got much choice, have we? All right, let's go. What's going on? What are you doing Please, in here? Police officers, you're under arrest. You want to take the press, Frank? Right. You have no right to come in here like this. I know my rights. You haven't got a warrant. You've got no right to act like this. You want to kill us, Frank? I got it. 
Got a place for the press, Joe. Doing the green overlay. Take a look. Yeah. You haven't got any right touching those. They're mine. They belong to me, mister. Where'd you get the plates, Jackson? They're good, aren't they, mister? The very best. Where'd you get them? Made them? Made them myself. Where'd you learn engraving? In prison. When they sent me to prison, I learned all about engraving. Real engraving. Not photo process, but the real thing. Finest place I've ever seen. The best. Beautiful money, isn't it? Best I've ever seen. Fool anybody. Did it all myself. Pass it anywhere. Fool anybody anywhere. Yeah. Just look at it, mister. That's a genuine article, isn't it? Real money. It's perfect. Absolutely perfect, mister. No, you're wrong there. Hmm? The government didn't print it. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 11th, trial was held in federal court, Southern District of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, we've tried very hard to set a dragnet standard. Now, to put that in just a few words, we try to make each program the kind of entertainment that you want. Now, we're going to keep working real hard at that. And you know, the people who make Chesterfields feel the same way about their cigarette. To sell a product, you have to make it good and keep it good. And the latest reports from our research lab shows Chesterfield is highest in quality. Highest in quality, low in nicotine. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Chesterfield, regular or king size. They're milder, they're satisfying, they're best for me, best for you. <laughs> Alex Carmichael, Howard Raymond Nielsen, Ernest Richard Hunter, Philip Roger Harger, and Stanley Norman Jackson were tried and convicted of violation of Title 18, U.S. Code, Section 474, printing and issuing counterfeit money. Violation of this title is punishable by a fine of $5,000 and imprisonment in a federal penitentiary for a period not to exceed 15 years. <laughs> just heard Dragnet, the series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Clarence Cassell, Jack Crucian, Harry Bartell. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork tip Fatima? It's the smooth smoke with Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering and Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, Fatima, with tips of perfect cork, is made and guaranteed by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company. This one's about Pete Kelly. It's about the world he goes around in. It's about the big music and the big trouble and the big twenty. So when they ask you, tell them this one's about the blues. Pete Kelly's blues. Kelly's Blues, starring Jack Webb, with story by Joe Eisinger and music by Dick Kettner. My name's Pete Kelly. I play cornet. You'll find us at 417 Cherry Street, Kansas City, on the Missouri side. It's a standard speakeasy. The slot in the front door is regulation size. 
just wide enough to frame a suspicious eye, and the bottoms of the shot glasses aren't quite thick enough to reach the top. It's a well-run orderly crib, the kind of a place the local prohibition agents can bring their wives to. The lease is owned by George Lupo. He's a fat, friendly little guy who always has his hand in his pocket. We start grinding every night about ten, and we play till Lupo runs out of inventory. But that's all right with us. He lets us play the kind of music we like. And on the breaks, he doesn't care how many nickels we throw into the pianola. Our nickels, his pianola. We were winding up the second set last night when Little Izzy came in. Little Izzy's a cab driver who's been working the joints up and down Cherry Street. He's carted more drunks than Lupo ever counted in his wildest dreams. And once a week, he lights a candle to Mr. Volstead. But last night, Little Izzy wasn't hauling a lush. She was a white-haired, gentle old lady, the motherly type that Mary Carr plays in Over the Hill. She looked around the crib, nervous and bewildered, as little Izzy eased her down at the small table near the bar. He smiled at her as gently as little Izzy can smile and started for the bandstand. Hi, Izzy. How's the taxi business? Yesterday I picked her up. I've been hauling her ever since from barrel house to barrel house, from crib to crib. What's she looking for? A girl. What girl? Her daughter. Who's her daughter? A singer. What's her name? June Gould. June Gould. You know her? You know this male? Yeah, she... she's a beautiful girl. I haven't heard about her for almost a year. She used to sing over at Maury. So where's she now? You know, you know her? Where's she now? I don't know. Uh, six, two, or nothing. Every crib we hit, yeah, sure, I remember June Gould, but where is she now? Six, two, and nine. Well, look, maybe I can... Look, Izzy, tell the old woman to wait. Maybe I can send up a flare. Oh, sure. thanks. Thanks, Petey boy. I got it. So good. All right. Petey. Let's go. Yeah, Red. That's June Gould. Beautiful gal. Yeah. Ever hear Nails Norton? Yeah. He used to torch for her with a thousand watt torch. So? So she wouldn't give me coffee that spilled in a saucer. So? So I wouldn't go asking around about it. So let's do the number, huh? So sure. All right. Whispering, good and bright. Here we go. Everybody ready? All right.
take five. Use some nickels, huh, Red? Oh, man, that loophole he's going to get rich off of. Petey, this is Miss Gould. How do you do, Miss Gould? Miss Gould, this is Pete Kelly. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly here said he'll take care of everything for you, Mrs. Gould. Well, I, I didn't exactly say Your that. worries are over now, Mrs. Gould, so I'll leave you with Mr. Kelly and good luck. No, Izzy, wait a minute, wait. Mr. Kelly, I, I don't know how to thank you. You've given me new hope. I was ready to... Sure, all right, now, come on. It's going to be all right, Miss Gould. Don't cry. Well, I'm sorry. But it's so hard to... Well, come on now. Let's unglue it. Tell me about it, huh? Well, my little girl, June, she was always a very beautiful child. We lived alone in Cleveland. Her father died when she was a baby. She always had a lovely voice. She went to... came here to Kansas City to get a start as a singer. When was this? Two years ago. Last I heard, she was working in a place called Morris. Uh-huh. She would write to me every week. I always send me a check for support. Oh, she's a good girl, Mr. Kelly. And I'm so worried. How long haven't you heard from her? Oh, it's been more than six, seven months now. No letters. No letters at all. But each week, a money order. But no letter. Each week you get a money order? From her? Well, I don't know. There's no letter, no name. Just the money order to support me. And I finally saved enough to come here to look for her. Yeah, I see. Oh, I've tried everything, Mr. Kelly. Yeah. All right, you wait here, Mrs. Gould. I'll buzz around. Maybe I can come back with some answers for you. And, Mr. Kelly. Yeah? I beg you to promise me. No matter what the answers are, you tell me the truth. Yeah. Sure. Well, the way I figured it, I could have told her the truth then without even leaving the joint. But it wasn't easy. Not when you looked into her eyes. But where were the money orders coming from? Well, I had to make a pass at it, so I borrowed Red's Erskine Coupe, drove out to the edge of town where Maury's Country Club balanced itself neatly on top of a well-kept hill. Nobody could get into Maury's front door unless he showed a white tie. I got in through the kitchen and made for Maury's private office up on the second floor. Yes? Can I buy a minute of your time, Maury? Ah, come in, Pete. What can I do for you? You remember a singer who worked for you, June Gould? Yes. A cigar? No, no thanks. June Gould. I remember June Gould. Why? You got an idea where she is now? Why? Well, I'm trying to get a line on her. Why? For her mother? She's in town looking for her. I heard. She see you? She tried. You wouldn't see her? No. Why not? I had no information for her. You got some information for me? No, no information. But if you ask me, do I have advice, maybe that I got. Like what? Like stay away from this old lady, Kelly, or maybe you'll never live to be as old as she is. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Maury? Yeah. Is Nails Norton still in town? You know something, Kelly? Yeah. I can't figure how you live to be as old as you. And that did it. As clearly as he could, Maury was trying to tell me to go back to Lupo's, pick up my horn, and blow myself to a comfortable old age. And I agreed with him. That was the smart thing for me to do. Go back to 417 and forget all about June Gould. So I hustled the Erskine back downtown, cut across the 12th Street Bridge to the Kansas side, jolted down Boulder Road to Fat Annie's place and Maggie Jackson. Maybe more than a few people in town knew what had happened to June Gould, but if there was anybody who knew and who would tell me, it would be Maggie Jackson. Maggie was just going into a number when I walked in. You're just in time, Pete. I need some strong support. Hi, Maggie. How about helping me through one course of what have I done? I didn't bring my horn. How about Artie Hamilton? He's in the back room. He won't mind. Here. Well, Okay. Wait a minute, you better let me try an A here. It's a little loud. Just a minute. Okay, just a second. All right, I guess we can try it. All right, what have I done?
night, Kitty. Thanks a lot. Sure, Maggie. Here's Artie's horn. Look, Maggie, I need some information. Maybe you got an open line. What's bothering you, Petey? Maggie, you ever hear of a gal named June Gould? June Gould? Yeah, she worked over at Maury's over on the hill. Oh, yeah. Tall, flaming red hair with real green eyes. Yeah. And a voice like red velvet. Whatever became of her? That's what I'm trying to find out, Maggie. Ain't thought about her in a long time. She just dropped out of sight suddenly, like last year's calendar. Well, you got any idea, any idea at all, Maggie? Anything you heard? No, Petey. Never did know much about that gal. Except she used to bunk with another gal. Who? Dancer down at the Cuban casino. Name of Flora Acosta. Flora Acosta, huh? Thanks, Maggie. Sure. Good luck, Pete. Uh, well, the Cuban casino is a minor league trap over in Spanish town. They deal strictly for the natives who are homesick for their own rhythm. Flora Acosta was just going into her big finish. I folded myself into a corner and waited. <laughs> Mr. Costa? Gee? Can I talk to you for a minute? What is it? Well, it's kind of noisy out here. Well, I'm sorry, but I just... Look, have you heard from June Gould lately? Come into my dressing room, please. All right. Hello, little bird. Oh, you're such a happy little bird. Excuse me, Senora. Not a costume for my next number. Sure, it's all right. Now, tell me, who are you? Pete Kelly. I play cornet over at 417 Cherry. Oh, yes. Now I know. Well, I was told that you used to live with June Gould. Yeah, that's right. Do you know where she is now? No. Well, when did you see her last? Oh, a long time ago. I don't know. Well, did she say where she was going? No. She just pack up and go. Goodbye. Goodbye, Flora, my darling. She stay and she go. That's how she was. That's how she was? See. Si. Not how she is. Okay. Well, you said was, like you don't think she is anymore. No, I'm very sorry. You make too much English for me. Hello, little bird. Such a happy little bird. Yeah. Do you know any of her boyfriends? Boyfriends? Yeah. Oh, see, she has lots of boyfriends. Oh, so many. Nails Norton? Yes. One of her boyfriends, Nails Norton. I'm sorry, senor. You... Yeah, I know. I make too much English for you. Well, she has so many boyfriends, it's very confusing. Did you meet any of them? Believe me, senor, it's so confusing. Yeah, do you remember any of her boyfriends? She packed all her bags and she said, Goodbye, Flor. Goodbye, my darling. I'm going to be a bride. She was going to be married? See, si, see, si, that's it, married. Who is he? Yes. The man she was going to marry. Oh, he's a very rich man. She loves him very much. And she's so happy. Goodbye, Lord, she said. Goodbye, my darling. Yeah, I know. Now, what's his name? His name is Bishop. You have an English name, Bishop? Bishop? See, si, Tom Bishop. Very rich man. Do you know where he lives? In a big house. A very rich house. The street? Well, I don't know, but a very rich street. Yeah, well, thanks. Senor? Yeah. How you come to me with all these questions? You make me very sad, very worried about my friend. You think she's all right? Sure. You will please let me know, senor. I would be very sad, very worried about her. Sure. Thank you, senor. Hello, little bird. Such a happy little bird. Well, I left the happy little bird and found me a city directory. Thomas Bishop, Vice President, Grundy Savings Bank and Loan. Residence, 440 North Camberwell. Well, the house was set well back from the street, surrounded by an ornate iron fence and a million dollars worth of shrubbery. I made the long trip to the front door on foot, punched the door buzzer. Yes? Mr. Bishop? Yes? My name's Pete Kelly. Is Mrs. Bishop at home? What do you want with her? Her mother's in town. Her mother? Yeah, she'd like to see her. Are you sure you have the right bishop? You're Thomas Bishop, aren't you? Yes, but my wife's mother is dead. You sure? Of course I'm sure. I buried her. You buried her? Ten years ago. I'm sorry, young man. You must have the wrong bishop. No, no. I got the right bishop, but the wrong wife. What'd you do with June Gould? Be quiet. Afraid your wife will hear? What do you want? I want to know what happened to June Gould. Please, Mr. Kelly, not here. Police headquarters suit you better? I beg you, come away from the house. All right. Now, come on. Tell me about it. Mr. Kelly, I assure you... I don't want assurances. I want information. Where's June Gould? I don't know. You were going to marry her? It was a misunderstanding. You mean you already had a misunderstanding wife, huh? June knew I was married, but... We loved each other. We were going to run away. And what happened? I, I don't know. Now, come on. You're going to have to do better than that. We decided we'd made all the arrangements, and I never saw her again. I never heard from her. I searched everywhere, tried everything, but without success. Please believe me, Mr. Kelly. I'm telling you the honest truth. And you never got a line on her? No lead at all? Nothing. Except a vague rumor that she'd been seen with a man named Maxie Finn. Maxie Finn? The two-bit bookie? Yes. I was shocked when I learned what he is. 
I couldn't believe that she would... Yeah, leave the great Mr. Bishop for a mouse like Maxie Finn. That's what needles you, huh? No, Mr. Kelly. I don't blame you for thinking that. But the truth is, I loved her. She was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. And for the first time in my life, I... You see, I married when I was very young. Calculatingly, to put myself ahead in the world. Well, my marriage gave me what I thought it would. Great financial success. But I didn't realize I was only living half a life until I met you. Yeah. Did you talk to Finn? No, not directly. But I did have uh, communication with him. Cautious type, huh? Yes. But for June Gould to spend the rest of whatever life I have left with her, I was ready to throw away all caution. You asked Finn about her? Yes. What word did he send back? Only two. Drop dead. Yeah. All right. I'm going to buy your story, but if it doesn't hang together, I'll be back for another one. While I knew where to find Maxie Finn, at the dice table in back of Sartori's garage, I pointed the Erskine for downtown KC. Maybe Bishop's story would hang together and maybe it wouldn't. Traffic in back of Sartori's garage was heavier than out front. The crap table was getting a big play. I spotted Maxie Finn's pasty face hanging over the one buck line. And the number is five. Make the point or break the joint. And the man throws. Days in the week, pass the dice to make tonight. All right, get aboard, boys. Get Maxie, aboard. Yeah. Get aboard. I got to talk to you. I'm on the roll. And the dice read. Days in the week, seven the man's down. Pass the dice to make tonight. Everybody wins. Everybody plays. Lay it on the line. We pay it on the line. Nothing but throw out, so. All right, let's get over here, Finn. It's important. What's your problem, Kelly? Right or wrong, I go along. All right, Kelly, I'm on the stock. My arm's cooling off. What's the hustle? June Gould. What? June Gould. You lost me. You sent word the bishop dropped dead. I send you the same. All right, come on. What happened to June Gould, Max? To me, you read like boxcars. Goodbye, Kelly. Come, come here. Uh, now, where is she? All right, come on. What'd you do to her? Nothing. I see her for maybe a couple of months, that's all. Why didn't she meet Bishop? She never said. Where'd she go after she left you? I don't know. But you got a pretty good idea. You got all I know. All right. All right. Maybe I can get a line. I'll call you. I'll try and I'll call you. All right. At Lupo's. Yeah. Yeah, I promise. At Lupo's. Just to make sure you keep your promise, Maxie. Here's a nickel. If you don't use it, I'll be back to take it away from you. Well, I had to leave it that way. I knew that by pushing Maxie Finn around, I'd started something in motion. There'd have to be a reaction. Back at 417, I found Mrs. Gould right where I'd left her. She looked up at me anxiously as I went over to her table. Any news, Mr. Kelly? I'm waiting for word now, Mrs. Gould. Do you think that... Mrs. Gould, I don't think. This is the time for waiting. It's the toughest time of all. Where are you stopping? The Jefferson Hotel. All right, now, look, you go back there. Oh, no, I... don't, don't argue. No, you're sitting in this trap the rest of the night. Get yourself some rest. I'll call you as soon as I get word. All right, Mr. Kelly. I'll do as you say. Somehow I feel you're the only one who could help me. All right, Mrs. Gould. Bye. All right, let's hold it down. Hold it down. Come on, Petey. Let's get with it. We lost all our business and we're out of nickel. All right. What's up? Blues and B flat. All right, I'll give you the pickup. Mm. Petey, 
Yeah. Neil Norton. Heading this way. Yeah. Kelly. Yeah. Come down. Oh, there. What for? This. <laughs> Now you forget all about June Gold, see? Next time I drop you, you won't get up ever. Well, I pulled myself together from all corners of the joint, raced for the Erskine, walloped it downtown to Sartori's garage. I felt no pain, nothing but a wild flaming anger. I had all my connections, from Maggie to Flora, to Bishop to Finn to Nails. Finn to Nails Norton. Finn kept his promise all right. He'd used the nickel, but not to call me. The crap game was still hot, but Maxie Finn had lambed. I tore around town and finally caught up with Finn in the back room at Joe Donegan. He saw me coming, turned to dirty gray, and tried to duck out the back. He never made it. The first word I threw at him was a right from the floor. <laughs> All right, Maxie. Please, please, Kelly. Stop it, Joey, stop it. All right. You called Nails Norton. I, I had to. You told him I'm looking for June Gould. Now, give me the truth. 725 Baltimore. Louder. June. 725 Baltimore. The truth, Kelly. The truth. 725, room six. All right, Maxie. If you ain't leveling this time, I'll break in two. <laughs> 725 Baltimore was only three traffic violations away from Joe Donegan. It wasn't much of a place and never was. I found room six on the second floor. I rapped on the door and waited. I rapped again. The door was opened wide. First thing I saw across the room was something propped up in a chair. It was all wrapped up in a quilted bathrobe that the house dog probably refused. Long, lifeless hair straggled down onto the shoulders. It must have been a woman, but I wouldn't swear to it in a court of law. You couldn't tell by the face. A mass of gnarled, scarred tissue, the mouth pulled into a permanent fixed grin. A bottle of gin was held on a broomstick hand. The first shock over, I looked at the man behind the door. That was the second shock, the one I didn't get over. Nails Norton. All right, Nails. Tell him to come all the way in. Go ahead. You got a strong stomach, Kelly? Because if you ain't, you better look the other way. Nails here, he's got a good strong stomach, ain't you, Nails? Yes, June. June. Yeah, I'm June. June Gould, the beauty. Yeah. Well, you finally found me, Kelly. So take a good look. Something to remember on those long nights when you can't sleep. What happened? He wants to know what happened there. Isn't good for you, dear. Let me take you out. No, I'll tell him. Ask it. That's what happened. Who? Tom Bishop's wife. But he doesn't know. Nobody knows. Except his wife, Maxie Finn and Nails. Now you. Yeah. She knew about me and Tom. She came before I could meet him with the acid. You never did anything to her. Never. What could I do that would give me back my face? No, let her live with it. As he can, he found me like that, took care of me. All the while, Nails here, he was looking for me. Nails, he always cared for me, didn't you, Nails? Yes, I did. Now Nails takes good care of me. Sees that I have everything I need. And all I need is a quarter day. All I need and all I want. Nails is a good boy. He can send my mother money every week. He's a good boy. Yeah. She's in Kansas City, your mother. Yeah, we heard. That's why Nails tried to stop you. Well, why don't you? You could write to her. No, letters can be traced. Yeah, but she's worried sick about you. If you could only let her know. What? Let her know what? You think I want to let her see me like this? You think she... <laughs> yeah. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. You found me. Tell her. Bring her to see me. Make the rest of her days happy. Yeah. Kelly. Yeah. What are you going to do? Apologize to Maxie Finn. Pete Kelly's Blues, starring.
starring Jack Webb, with story by Joe Eisenberg and music by Dick Cathcart. Scoring by Matty Matlock. Music of Chief Kelly's Big Seven consists of Dick Cathcart on cornet, Matty Matlock on clarinet, Nick Patool on drum, Ray Sherman on piano, George Bennett on guitar, Jeb Demott on bass, Mo Schneider on trombone. The songs of Maggie Jackson were written by Arthur Hamilton. Kelly's Blues is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A young girl has been found in a cheap hotel room, apparently an attempted suicide. There's reason to suspect foul play. Your job, investigate. To sell a product, you have to make it good and keep it good. What do the latest reports show about Chesterfield? Well, our research laboratory has compared it with the leading cigarettes in the country. Chesterfield is highest in quality, low in nicotine. Another good reason why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular or king size, you'll find Chesterfield really mild, really satisfying. Best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, November 19th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. We just gotten a call from Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, and it was 9.46 a.m. when we got to the second floor. The treatment room. Yes? Would you like to see Dr. Hall, please? Come in, Joe. Joe, Frank. Hi, Hi. Doc. Is this the girl? Yeah. How's she doing? I'm well, not sure yet. Just finished the transfusion. Well, when are you going to know? We think she's going to live, but there's no way of telling right now how much damage has been done to the brain tissue. Mm-hmm. Bad bruise on her face. Must have received a bad blow. Might have gotten when she fell. Mm-hmm. Let's go outside. Huh? I can use the smoke. Okay. Well, if there's any change, I'll be out in the hall. All right, Doctor. 
You've got a cigarette. I'm fresh out. Yeah, here you are. Frank? Yeah, thanks. Here's a match. Thanks. I didn't know you gave transfusions in cases like this, Doc. Well, have to very often. You see, a thing like this, the carbon monoxide in the gas joins with the hemoglobin in the red cells. won't let go. Blood takes the monoxide through the system and suffocates the brain tissue. We've given her some coramine. Helps speed up the heart action. The way it looks, she's got a good chance of living, but we won't know how bad it really is until later. It's a rough one, isn't it? You find out who she is? Well, according to the stuff we found in her wallet, her name's Mona Fenton. Another thing that doesn't make much sense, Doc, she registered into the hotel as Mrs. John Norris. Near as we can find out, she wasn't married. How'd you come up with that? Well, when the office got word about it, we tried to get in touch with her husband. We called the phone number on the ID that we found in her wallet, talked with her mother. She says the girl's single. Well, how about the guy she was with? Have you been able to talk to him? No. I haven't found out who he is. Name doesn't check out, huh? Not that we can find. How about the mother? she give you anything? Well, we just talked to her for a minute. We're going over there when we leave here. Maybe she can come up with some answers. I sure hope so. A couple of more questions you can ask her. Yeah? What's that? Find out if the girl's been under a doctor's care. What do you mean? Checked her over when she came in. Found marks. On her arm? Yeah. I think she's an addict. At 8.30 a.m. that morning, a guest in a small hotel on Grand Avenue had thought that he detected the odor of gas in the halls of the building. He notified the desk clerk, and together they conducted a search of the premises. Finally, they ascertained that the escaping gas was coming from a room on the third floor of the hotel. When the desk clerk got no answer to his calls, he used a passkey to open the door. Sprawled across the bed was a girl who appeared to be in her early 20s. The gas heater in the room had been turned on full and the windows were closed, locked and stuffed with pieces of torn sheets to keep the fumes in the room. The quick action of the desk clerk had undoubtedly saved the girl's life. While the hotel guest called an ambulance, the clerk turned off the gas, opened the windows, and administered artificial respiration to the girl until the ambulance crew arrived. As an attempted suicide, the homicide detail had to make an investigation and Frank and I were assigned to the case. After we talked to Doc Hall at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, we drove down to the hotel where the girl had been found. Right in here. Anybody been in this room since the other officers left? No, sir. They told me to lock it until you could see it. All right, sir. Well, this is just the way you found it, is that right? Well, yes, of course. The gas is turned off and I opened the windows, but uh, everything else is the same. I see. From what you said on the phone, she came in last night, is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, at least that's what the registration book says. They checked in at uh, 10.15. Did you take care of them? No, I was out to dinner when they got here. Who checked them in? Jeff, Jeff Christensen. Is he around? No, not right now. He'll probably be back tonight. You know where we can find him? Well, I don't know. See, Jeff got paid last night. Got his week's wages. Last I saw him, he was on his way out on the town with some of his friends. Jeff goes out on the town. Maybe we don't see him in a couple of days. I see. But you figure he'll be back tonight, huh? Oh, yes, yes. Jeff only worked a couple of days last week, so he ain't going to go on much of the town. Mm-hmm. Did you see the man Miss Fenton came in with? No, I didn't. You were already in the room when I got back from dinner. I uh, checked the book. I got the money from Jeff before I left. The man must have gone out sometime earlier this morning. I guess I was asleep. My room's just back of the desk. Fella must have got out while I was asleep. I see. Did you get any calls from the room at all? Not a one. Like I told those uniformed officers we hear, I didn't see them at all. Not a people. As a matter of fact, I was thinking how nice and quiet they were. But, but the way the room looks, they sure must have had some sort of argument. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh-huh. Would you know if they brought any baggage with them? Matter of fact, I know they didn't. Sure looks like they did some heavy drinking, don't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Glasses. That bottle was almost empty. Yeah. I'd rather you wouldn't touch the bottle. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, I'm... Say, uh, you talked to the girls' people yet? No, sir, we haven't. But you plan to see them, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, I wonder if you'd do me a favor. You, you know when you see a people? Yes, sir, what's that? Well, I, I don't much mind the dirty glasses and having to straighten the room up. That's all part of the hotel business, but I wish you'd say something about the torn sheets. Tell the people about them. I don't want to cause no trouble, but maybe if they know how about the sheets were all torn up, they'd want to make good on them. You will mention them, won't you, hmm? Yes, sir. I'll call the office, Joe. Have him send out a crew. See what prints we can lift. All right, fine. Who else has a pass key to this room? Oh, you mean beside me? Yes, sir. Well, ain't nobody. Where's the key kept? That hangs on a nail next to the desk. That big nail there. It hangs right on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you came into the room, did you notice if there was anything around the door to keep the gas inside? Uh, I don't follow you. Well, you found pieces of torn sheets around the windows, you say. 
Now, was there anything like that with the door? Oh, oh, yes, I'm with you now, yeah. Now, let me think. As I remember, no, no, there wasn't nothing there, just around the windows. Mm -hmm. Was the key in the lock when you came up here? You mean inside the room? Yes, sir, that's right. No, no, the reason I know that for sure is that I looked through the keyhole, tried to see what was in the room. No, sir, the key wasn't in. Of course, (laughs) that don't mean nothing. Sir? Well, only a couple of the rooms have keys anyway. We don't use them anymore. You mean you don't lock the doors? Sure, we lock the doors. We got them all locked all the time. This is a respectable hotel. Of course, we lock the doors. But not with those keys. We got those other locks on the doors. Oh, I see. You see, yeah, see that? Sort of like Yale locks? That kind, you know. That's uh, what locks the doors, not the other keys. Yes, I see. Of course, we lock the doors. Yes, sir. The locks catch when the door is closed, though, is that right? Yeah, locks them tight. I got in touch with Lee Jones, Joe. He sent a crew right over. Good. I checked with Doc Hall. How's the girl? Oh, she's coming along. Doc says she's doing better. Oh, these fellows that you're going to have roaming around here. What's this all about? Is something wrong? We're not sure yet, sir. Oh, dear, dear. It always happens like this, don't it? What's that, sir? I try to run a respectable place. Goodness knows I do. I keep it right up to date. It's good service, and something like this happens. There was no reason for that girl to do a thing like this. Not in my hotel. Now you cops come in here. Cops going to be all over the place. Tenants aren't going to like it. They ain't going to like it at all. Just because of that girl. Why'd she have to come in here and do a thing like this? Why'd she have to do it at all, sir? <laughs> a.m. We questioned the people in the hotel. None of them could remember hearing any undue noise coming from the room where the girl had tried to kill herself. Normally, the investigation would have been routine, but with the possibility of foul play, we had to check every angle and then check it again. The crew from the crime lab arrived and went over the room. Under the bed, they found an empty capsule, the type commonly used to dispense heroin. They also came up with a clean set of fingerprints on both glasses. They were photographed, and the water glasses themselves were removed to the crime lab to be booked as evidence. The registration card the couple had signed was turned over to Don Meyer in handwriting. The name was checked through our record bureau, through the phone book, and through the city directory, but when the leads were checked out, we were no further in knowing who the man was who'd taken the room with Mona Fenton. Word was left at the hotel for the handyman to contact us as soon as he returned. Word was also left that if the man who'd registered with the Fenton girl returned, we were to be called. 11.45 11.45 a.m., the men from the crime lab finished their investigation and returned to the office to compile the results. Frank and I left the hotel and drove out to the address listed on the girl's identification. It was a large white colonial home near one of the colleges. We rang the doorbell and waited. Yes? Mrs. Fenton? Yes, that's right. What is it you want? Police officers would like to talk to you. Oh, come in. Thank you. It's about Mona, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. I knew something like this would happen. I knew it all along. Beg your pardon? When she first had this crazy idea, when she first told me about it, I knew. Kids, try to tell them. Just try, and they tell you that times have changed. They say that you're not keeping up with the time. They know it all. Nobody can tell them anything. Well, what idea is this, Mrs. Fenton? When she wanted to quit school and take the job in that drive-in restaurant, the most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. But nobody could talk her out of it. Lord knows I tried. I knew something like this would happen. I just knew it. Yes, ma'am. Do you know any reason why your daughter might want to take her own life? Are you a policeman, too? Yes, ma'am. I'm Frank Smith. This is my partner, Joe Friday. How do you do? How are you, ma'am? Do you know any reason why your daughter might want to kill herself? It's a little hard to say, Mr. Friday. What's that? Mona and I had quite an argument about her leaving school. It was one of those silly things that starts and gets all out of hand, you know. We both have pride, and neither one of us was going to back down. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen Mona to talk to for over a month. Does she live here, ma'am? Yes, she does, Mr. Smith. But there's an outside entrance to her room. She comes and goes as she pleases. Doesn't eat her meals here, so I hardly ever see her. Mm -hmm. Do you know if she's been under a doctor's care? No, I don't think so. Why do you ask that? Well, is your daughter a diabetic? No, she isn't, Mr. Friday. Why all these questions about Mona and a doctor? What are you trying to find out? Does your daughter have any special boyfriends, Mrs. Fenton? She did have. Who was that? Richard Burdick, nice boy. Mona and he were planning to get married when they got out of school. Then, along with everything else, that just blew up. Everything seemed to go all at the same time. Did your daughter have any trouble with this verdict? No. Nothing you could call real trouble. It's just that they agreed to disagree. With Mona's idea, Richard didn't want anything to change. He was very much in love with her. Uh Uh-huh. 
Does he know about this? I don't think so, Miss Fenton. We haven't told him. I don't know what he's going to do when he hears about it. It's going to hit him awfully hard. He's the sensitive type. Does your daughter have any close friends that she might confide in? I suppose she does. She's talked about some of the girls where she worked. Would you give us their names, please? Oh, yes, I will. I'll write them down for you, those I can remember. All right, fine. Has your daughter been in good spirits lately? As far as I know, yes. She's always seemed happy enough when I saw her. I told you we haven't said much more than hello the last month, but she seemed happy. Mm -hmm. You said that she broke up with this Burdick boy, is that right? Yes. When was that? Six weeks, two months ago. You know what caused it? The job, all the other things. Mona kept making dates with him and then breaking them at the last minute. I guess Richard just got tired of being stood up. Well, did he and your daughter have any arguments that you know of? No. They just decided that it wouldn't work out for them. They just decided to stop seeing each other. Did your daughter have any other steady boyfriends? Anyone that she saw quite a bit of, maybe? Well, there was one boy. He was quite a bit older than Mona. She saw a lot of him the last couple of weeks. You know who he was? No, I never met him. I only saw him once. What if you could describe him for us? No, I'm afraid I can't. He drove by for Mona one night, going to pick her up for a date. Parked out in front and honked the horn. I see. I went to the front door to tell him to come in. Mona wasn't ready yet, but he wouldn't. Just sat out there and waited. I didn't get a good look at him. Could you describe the car for us? Not good. It was one of those foreign cars, a convertible. I think it might have been a Jaguar. I'm not sure about that, though. But you're sure it wasn't an American automobile? Yes, I'm sure about that. All right. How about the color of the car? Can you tell us that? It was awfully dark out there. I'm not sure. I'd rather not say, officer, if I can't be sure. You understand that. I wouldn't want to tell you something and then have it turn out to be wrong. You can understand that, can't you? Yes, ma'am, of course. Did you see Mona this morning? Yes, we did. Is she all right? They think so, yes. Aren't you sure? Well, when we talked to the doctor, they were doing everything they could. They seemed to think that she was going to be all right. Thank God. It's so hard, Mr. Friday, to know that your child is sick, that she tried to kill herself, to want to go to her and not be able to. It's so hard. <laughs> Try to take it easy if you can, Miss Fenton. If you'll just give us the names of the girls that she might know, we'll be on our way. Yes, I'll write them for you. Thank you. Excuse me? Shirley? Hello? Yes, it is. What? Yes, they're here. Just a moment. It's for you. I'll get a jump. I'll get those names for you, Mr. Friday. All right, fine. Did your daughter ever refer to this man in the foreign car by name? No, I don't think she did. All I know is that whenever she went out with him, it was the big date of the bunch. How often did she see him? Maybe a couple of times a week. Might have been more. I had no way of knowing what she was doing. She kept pretty much to herself when she met him, but... I could tell he was the big thing in her life. He was it. Go? Yeah. Stay a minute? Yes. Excuse me, Miss Fenton. I'll finish this list. Thank you. Yeah. Call was from Jack Smyers at the office. Yeah. Just removed her to the general hospital. Yeah. She had a relapse. They don't think she's going to live. You are listening to Dragnet. The authentic story of your police force in action. There are good reasons why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Why Chesterfield is the largest selling two-way cigarette in America. Why Chesterfield is best for me and best for you. People these days want facts. When you want people to use your product, you have to tell them what effect it has on people who do use it regularly. That's why a doctor has examined for almost two years a large group of Chesterfield smokers. Forty-five percent of them have, on the average, been smoking Chesterfields for well over ten years. What is the effect on these people from smoking Chesterfield? No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses, says the doctor. Consider Chesterfield's record with these smokers, with millions of other smokers throughout America. Another good reason for you to change to Chesterfield. Regular or king size, Chesterfield is best for me. Best. For you. We obtained the name of the drive in restaurant where the Fenton girl was employed. We also got the names of the girls that she worked with and the address of her boyfriend, Richard Burdick. Mrs. Fenton also gave us a list of names of persons who might be able to aid us in the investigation. Under further questioning, the mother was still unable to furnish us with a motive for her daughter's attempt to take her own life. The apparent lack of a motive, 
or any type of a suicide note coupled with the bruise on the girl's chin made the likelihood of foul play more than possible. 12.57 p.m. We left the Fenton home and drove over to the drive-in. We stopped on the way and put in a call to the office. There still hadn't been any report of the handyman at the hotel, the only person who could give us a description of the man who registered at the place with the Fenton girl. When we got to the drive-in, we asked about a Peggy Griegson, one of the girls on the list. After a few minutes, the girl came over to our car. You want to see me? You Peggy Griegson? Yeah, why? We'd like to ask you some questions about Mona Fenton. Who are you guys? Police officers. We'd just like to talk to you. i got to get it okayed with the manager. I'm on duty now, lunchtime. Pretty busy. i got to get it okayed. I'll take care of it. All right, fine. I'll check with the manager, Joe. Right. Well, this isn't going to take long. i got a couple of customers waiting for orders. My partner will take care of it. Why ain't the manager knowing that worries me? It's the tips they're going to leave. You make what I do, and the tips are important. Yes, ma'am. What's all this about Mona, anyway? What are the cops after her for? Well, she tried to kill herself this morning. Mona? Yes. Why? Why'd she do a thing like that? Well, we thought maybe you could help us there. Why, me? I haven't got anything to do with it. Well, we understand you're pretty friendly with it. Well, sure, I was a friend of Mona's, but I don't know anything about no suicide. I don't know anything about it, and I don't want to. Do you know any reason she might try to take her own life? Not a reason in the world. Not Mona. Do you know if she was under a doctor's care for any reason? No. I mean, I don't know. She didn't say anything about it. Never said a word. Was she? Well, that's what we're trying to find out. Can you think of any enemies she had? Anybody who might have wanted to hurt her? How far is this going to go? Well, how do you mean, miss? I mean, who's going to hear about this? Who's going to hear the answers I'm going to give her? Well, no one. Now, what do you got for us? Well, I'll give you this for free. If anything happened to Mona, you go talk to Dick Burdick. Talk to him. He'll be able to tell you. Why do you say that? Because it's true. No other reason. He's a real bum. You ask me, I think there's something wrong with him. You know, in the head. Well, do you have any reason to say that? All the reason in the world. Poor girl, this bum all the time coming around giving her trouble. All the time telling her how he's going to kill her and anybody that comes near her. Burdick said that to Miss Fenton, did he? Half a dozen times. It wasn't more than a week ago. Mona told me she told him off, told him to get lost. She didn't want any part of him, to leave her alone. He made a big scene. Mona told me all about it. One day this Terry drove in here. Got one of those flashy foreign cars. The Jaguar? I think so, yeah. All right, go ahead. Well, one day he drove into the place. Mona took care of him. I guess he liked Mona. He kept coming back, always parked in her station. Anyway, this Burdick kid found out about it. Wasn't anything for him to worry about, but he made a big thing about it. Mm-hmm. Told Mona she was supposed to stop seeing Terry. Said if she didn't, he was going to cause real trouble. Did he see what he was going to do? Well, I think he was kidding. I don't think he really meant it. He's just a kid. Well, what would he say? I really don't think he meant it. Well, all right. Now, what did he say to her? Said if he found them together again... Kill them both. We talked to the other girls on the drive-in. From them, we got the same story about the scenes that Richard Burdick had created. We got more information about the threats that he'd made against the Fenton girl and Terry Hamilton. From one of the girls, we got the address of Hamilton. 2.45 p.m. We left the drive-in and drove over to the address of the girl's boyfriend, Richard Burdick. We talked to the landlady. She told us that the Burdick boy had regular habits. He paid his rent on time. He never had any visitors. She told us that he wasn't in his room at that time, but she said that she'd let us in. In her company, we went upstairs. She unlocked the door, and Frank and I went in. I'll well, check the bedroom. I'll take the kitchen. Yeah. Well, there's nothing out there. How'd you do? Well, it looks like we're a little late. What? His clothes are gone. We checked the room further. Every indication was that Richard Burdick had left the apartment in a hurry. We talked to the landlady again. She could give us no reason for his disappearance. She gave us the name of his employer. We put in a call to them, but they told us that Burdick had failed to show up for work that day. 4.15 p.m. We put in a call to the hotel on Grand Avenue, but the handyman still hadn't returned and there'd been no word from him. We went back to the office and checked the name Richard Burdick through R&I, but we found no criminal record for anybody answering his description. We put out a local and an APB on him. At 4.39 p.m., we got a call from General Hospital telling us that the Fenton girl had regained consciousness and that we could talk to her. Frank and I left the office and traveled Code 2 out to the hospital. The doctor on duty told us that the girl was out of danger, but that she was very weak. He asked us not to get her excited, and he led us into her room. Miss Fenton? Yes, who are you? Police officers. Why can't you leave me alone? Go away. Just a couple of questions we'd like to ask you. I don't want to talk to anybody. Why Why didn't you leave things the way they were? Why didn't you leave me alone? Well, you had a lot of people worried, miss. No reason for it. It'd be better all the way around if things had happened the way I planned them. And you did try to kill yourself? Yes. 
Who was with you in that hotel room? You mean Mr. Morris? Yeah. It was Terry. It was always Terry. He was going to marry me, then he didn't. He said he would, and he didn't. That way you did what you did? Yes. You used narcotics, Miss Fenton? Hmm? You used narcotics? Yes, that was Terry's idea, too. I think that's all he wanted with me, just to get me hooked so I'd have to do what he said. I think that was the reason. How about this Richard Burdick? What about him? Do you have anything to do with you deciding to take your own life? In a lot of ways. The biggest mistake I ever made was leaving Richard. I thought it was smart, real smart. I was going to show him. Terry said he'd marry me. He said he was in love with me. He gets you started on narcotics? Yeah. At first it wasn't so bad. I loved him, really, I did. Then when I had to have the fixes, he changed. He told me he couldn't give it to me anymore. That I was going to have to pay for it. I tried to tell him to tell him that I loved him. That I wanted to be with him. That's so why I went to the hotel to talk it over. Try to come to an understanding, some kind of an understanding. Mm-hmm. He said that he didn't want to have anything to do with me. That he wanted no part of me anymore. Said that I was going to have to pay for the H from now on. I didn't have any way to pay for it. He said it wasn't any of his business. Is he a user? Yes. It's all so stupid, all so stupid. Ma'am? The whole thing, I had it real good all the way around. And then I went ahead and ruined everything, tore it all down. Even if I'd have killed myself, it would have been no answer. Not the right answer, anyway. I know that. I know it real well. All right. Can you tell us where we can find this Terry? You bet I can. I want to see him feel like I do. I want him to know what it's like. Will you be willing to meet with him? Make a buy of narcotics for us? You name the time, I'll be there. I'll be there if I have to crawl. All right. You better get some rest now. I guess so. I'm pretty tired. Did you see my mother? Yes, ma'am. Is she real mad at me? No, I don't think she is. Would you call her? Ask her to come and see me? Tell her I'm sorry. Tell her I want to see her. Now, she'll be glad to hear that. I hope so. I got so much to tell her, her and Richard. So much to tell them both. All right, Miss Fenton. We'll get in touch with her. And you tell me when you want me to call Terry. You tell me. All right, we will. Terrible thing, isn't it? What's that? Terry. He's been around a long time. Must be other girls in the same fix all because of him. Girls who have a bad habit and have to do what he says. Girls like me, terrible. Nobody knows how many. Yes, ma'am. Where's it going to end? When you meet him. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 10th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Veneman. Obviously, it would be impossible for you to question all the Chesterfield smokers that you'd run into, yet we're convinced that you want to know what effect the product has on people who do use it regularly. Well, Chesterfield tells you. Now, you've heard the report from the doctor who's been examining Chesterfield smokers. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. I think it would make good sense for you to change to Chesterfield today. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular or king size, you'll find Chesterfield's best for you. Terry Norris Hamilton was tried and convicted of violation of the State Narcotics Act, a felony, one count. He received sentence as prescribed by law. Violation of the State Narcotics Act, a felony, is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of from one to five years. Mona Irene Fenton pled guilty to the same charge and was placed on probation for a period of three years with the provision that she be placed under the care of a competent psychiatrist. Just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. 
Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Rodman, Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Announcing the best of filter cigarettes, L&M filters. The L&M filter is entirely pure, harmless to health. Filters out the heavy particles in the smoke, gives you more flavor, less nicotine. L&M filters and Fatima with tips of perfect cork, both made and guaranteed by the makers of Chesterfield. Lincoln and Myers Tobacco Company. Here, John Cameron Swayze and the news next on the NBC Radio Network. Down there on the couch. Move that Afghan. I was laying down when you got here. Terrible thing. I just know it. Yes, ma'am. If you tell us about it, please. You just bet I will. First off, can I get you something? Maybe a cup of coffee, a little piece of cinnamon toast? No, no, thank you, ma'am. Okay. You change your mind. You just let me know. Yes, we will. Now, if you just tell us about Miss Gillespie, please. I hope if anything ever happens to me, I get this kind of service. Yes, ma'am. Are you a friend of Mrs. Gillespie? Her best. That's why I know something's happened to her. Uh Uh-huh. She wouldn't just take off like this without telling me. Matter of fact, she didn't tell nobody. Just all of a sudden, she was gone. All right, if you'd start right at the beginning and just tell us the whole story, please. Well, Bertha Gillespie and me have been friends for years. I see. Her and me have been friends for years, ever since her husband died and she opened up the tea cozy. That's the little tea shop she has. Yeah. Nice place. She's done real good with it. All the ladies in the neighborhood were down there for afternoon tea. Served those little tiny cake rolls with a pot of tea. Ladies' fingers, you know. Yes, ma'am. Well, a couple of days ago, I went down there to see Bertha. You know what day that was? Hmm? I said, you know the exact date. Oh, well, now, let's see. This is Wednesday. I guess it must have been Saturday. Uh, yes, that's it, Saturday. All right, would you like to go ahead, please? Well, I went down to the tea cozy, and there was a sign right on the door telling how Bertha was sick, and she'd gone away for a couple of days. Was she in poor health? Bertha? Yes, ma'am. Bertha was as strong as an ox. Nothing wrong with her. Besides that, I saw her only Friday night. She didn't say nothing to me about being sick. Not a word. I see. That's what made me figure that there was something wrong. For the past ten years, if there was anything on Bertha's mind, she told me about it. You suspect she did. Well, isn't it possible that she just used the pretended illness as an excuse? That she just went away on a trip, maybe? Oh, Bertha wouldn't do that. Why do you say that? Because oh, she just wouldn't do it. Not with Saturday coming up. There isn't anything in the world that could make Bertha leave. Well, what's happening Saturday? Scrabble. The big part? Scrabble. You know, the word game. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, the ladies in the neighborhood have a sort of club. We meet down at the cozy and play our tournaments. Bertha's the champion. Hasn't been anybody that can beat her real good. You know, not regular. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that's why she wouldn't leave. This Saturday was her first big match outside the club. Woman from West Los Angeles was coming out here to challenge her. 
Bertha's been in training all week. But she wouldn't just walk out on the match. I'm telling you, officer, there's something wrong. What, well, Mrs. Gillespie any relatives here in Los Angeles? No. No, she's got some people back east. Uh, Mississippi, I think. Possible she might have left to go see them? I told you. Not with the big match coming on. Ain't nothing in the world could keep Bertha from playing in that. Nothing, and you believe it. Yes, ma'am. Does she have any men friends? Well, you mean romantic? Yes. Well, there's Chester, but that's not what I'd call a real romance. Bertha'd go out to the movies with him once in a while, and maybe he'd come over to the tea cozy even evening, and they'd sit there and watch the television. But there'd always be somebody else there, mostly me. No, no, you couldn't say that it was any kind of a romance with Chester. You have his address? Are you going to talk to him? Yes, ma'am. It won't be any good. I already did. He don't know where Bertha is. If you'll just give us the phone number of this Chester, we'll check on your friend. Yeah, you check. You'll find out what I said is true. Yes, ma'am. I think somebody done Bertha in. She wouldn't just take off like this without telling me. Well, now, ma'am, did she have any enemies in the neighborhood? Anybody that you think might want to do her harm? No, not a soul, not a single one. Isn't anyone who didn't like her. Well, maybe Mrs. Ruman didn't care much for her, but I think that was kind of a jealous thing. What do you mean? Scrabble. What was that? Mrs. Ruman, or Helen. She thought she could play the game. Then when she challenged Bertha to a match, well, it was, well, it was pretty terrible. 457 to 214. Helen was pretty upset. She tried to make out like she was a good loser, you know, kind of smiles and laughs. I could tell. He didn't like being skunked. Yes, ma'am. Can you think of any reason why anyone would want to harm Miss Gillespie? Well, not right off unless it was for money. What? Last time I saw her, she was carrying a lot of cash money around with her. Yeah. $2,500. <laughs> 10.33 a.m. We put in a call to missing persons detail and checked the name Bertha Gillespie through the file. There'd been no report filed on her, and her name did not appear in the Gaga file. We checked the name through R&I, but she had no criminal record in Los Angeles. 10.47 a.m. We drove by the Tea Cozy restaurant. On the front door, attached with cellophane tape, was a hand-lettered note reading, Taking a short vacation. Watch for reopening. Through the glass pane, we could see the interior of the shop. Everything appeared to be in order. Frank and I checked the rear of the building, but from what we could see, there was nothing out of line. 11.28 a.m., we put in a call to the missing woman's boyfriend, Chester Avon. He told us that he talked to the Gillespie woman on the previous Friday night, and she'd appeared in good spirits and had said nothing about leaving. We checked at her bank. We found that she'd made a withdrawal from her savings account to the amount of $2,500. This left a balance of over $12,000 in the savings account, $6,000 in the checking account. The manager of the branch told us that he'd spoken with Mrs. Gillespie when she'd taken the money, and that she told him that she was thinking of taking a short vacation. We got in touch with Miss Crocker and told her what we'd found. We asked her if she wanted to file a missing persons report. She said that she'd wait until the end of the week, and if her friend hadn't returned by then, that she'd come into the office. A month passed before we heard from her again. On the morning of Friday, August 20th, she called to tell us that she still hadn't heard from Mrs. Gillespie and asked that we conduct a formal investigation. She came down to the office and filled out a Form 316. Frank and I drove out to the restaurant to check it again. It was exactly as it had been when we'd last seen it. We tried the doors and found that they were still locked. 1.43 p.m. We went back to the office. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Well, that's kind of high, isn't it? Yeah. Well, did your people check into it? I see. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Mr. Jones. If you find out anything, we'd appreciate it if you'd give us a call. Right. That's Michigan 5211, extension 2521. Yes, sir. Either Officer Frank Smith or Sergeant Joe Friday. That's right. Thanks for your help. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, that finishes up the utility calls. Well, what do you got? Telephone bill for the past 30 days is just the service charge, no toll calls. Same with the electric lights. Uh-huh. They received payment in the last month, did they? No. Telephone company says they haven't been paid in over 60 days. Says they've sent a couple of reminders. Uh-huh. Only reason they haven't cut off the service is the bills have always been paid promptly in the past. I checked with their business office. Girl tells me the bill usually runs around ten bucks. Possible then that the phone hasn't been used at all, huh? Well, it shapes up that way. Same with the lights. The one thing doesn't match. Yeah, what's that? The water bill. I checked with them. Normal bill's about four bucks for the place. Yeah. The last sixty days it's been seventy nine dollars. A lot of water in it. Yeah. I 
I talked to one of the engineers at the company, a fellow named Jones. Yeah, what'd he tell you? Well, he told me there was only one thing that could cause a water jump like that. Yeah. A water tap. Yeah. Running for about a month. p.m. We called the bank where Mrs. Gillespie had her accounts. The head cashier told us that since the date she'd withdrawn the $2,500, there had been no deposits or withdrawals made. We telephoned the missing woman's friend, Mrs. Winifred Crocker. From her, we got the name and address of the owner of the building where the tea cozy restaurant was located. Frank and I signed out of the office and drove out to see him. The address we'd been given was a large house in the Silver Lake District. We rang the bell to the front door, but we got no answer. We walked around to the back of the property to a large garage. Well, Joe, if we find this guy, we can find out if she gave him some indication she was going to leave. Yeah. Sounds like there's somebody there. Yeah. In here, I guess. Uh-huh. Yeah? We'd like to see Virgil Medina. I'm him. What do you want? Police officers. We'd like to check out a few things with you if we can. What about? Well, it might be easier if we talked inside. I got no truck with the cops. I got none that I want. Now, now you can just ask your questions from out there. All right, sir. That's the way you want it. Well, that's the way it's going to be. Now, get your questions asked and go about your business. You own a building located at 687 Kenmore Avenue? Why? Look, Mr. Medina, we're trying to conduct an investigation. We'd like to have your cooperation. If you don't want to talk here, we can go downtown. I own the building. Why? You have a tenant named Bertha Gillespie? Yes. Why? When did you see her last? Well, about a month ago, at least that. Do you remember the exact date? I don't know. It's a long time ago. What's all this about Bertha, anyway? What are all these questions? You got something you want to know about it? Go ask her yourself. Anything I can tell you that she can't. Go talk to her. Leave me alone. Where'd you see her last? Down at the restaurant. What time of day? Night. Night time. Would you try to remember what date it was? It's pretty important. Wait a minute. I'll try to figure. See, I guess it must have been on a Saturday night. Yes, I'd say it was Saturday, the... uh, 10th of July. Do you have any way of being sure that that's the date? Now, look, you come around here asking questions, and I'm giving you an answer. You can take it or leave it. I got no way of being sure. That's the day I think I saw her last. She seemed in good spirits? What do you mean by that? Well, sir, was she happy, or was there something worrying her? Well, she seemed happy to me. I didn't pay a lot of attention. What are you cops trying to find out? You come right out and tell me what you want, and maybe I'll have the answer. But I haven't got time to stand around and waste time with you. Now, you, you tell me why you're asking these questions, or you can leave. Mrs. Gillespie's been reported missing. We're trying to trace it. Well, who done that? Who says she's missing? Well, that's not the important point here. We got the report. We've got to check it out. Well, who ever told you that's crazy? If Bertha's gone, there's a good reason for it. I guess she just finally got fed up and left town. What do you mean? She made a mint of money from that place. Regular mint. She used to tell me that when she had enough, she was going to just... Take off and see the world. Go around the whole world on a tramp steamer. She told me when she signed the last piece that she thought this would be the last one. Why, she ain't missing. She's just gone. Did she say anything to you about the fixtures in the place? Uh, What do you mean? You know, the furniture, all the fixtures. They belong to her, don't they? Yes, I guess so. Will she make any arrangements to dispose of them? Not to me, she didn't. What if you have a key to the place? The tea cozy? Yes, sir. No, I don't. You own the building and you don't have a key to the restaurant? Well, no, I had one, but I lost it. Never had another one made. Why? What do you want with the key? We hmm? want to check the premises. Well, as far as I'm concerned, you've got no right to do that. The place belongs to Mrs. Gillespie. You've got no right to go tromping around in there. I we're going to have to. Then you're going to do it without my say-so. All right, sir, that's the way it's going to be. I'm telling you, she ain't going to like it. She ain't going to like you going to the place when she isn't there. Well, we take that up with her. Well, you better, because I'm not going to take any responsibility for it. We're not asking you to, Mr. Medina. I'll give you this, though. Yes, sir, what's that? You go nosing around, you're liable to come up with something that you ain't looking for. Well, well, thanks for your help, Mr. Medina. Oh, mention it. Just remember what I told you about finding trouble and ain't looking for it. Well, that doesn't happen often. Huh? We're looking for it. 3.14 p.m. Frank and I drove back to the Tea Cozy restaurant on Kenmore Avenue. We checked the front door of the place. It was locked. While Frank covered one side of the building, I took the other side, looking for open windows. How about it? No, no luck. Me neither. What do we do now? Well, we're going to have to try to force one of the windows in the back. All right. Come on. I think maybe we can get in here. You're going to break it? We're going to have to. Wait a minute, Joe. Huh? You hear water running? 
Sounds like it's coming from inside. Yeah, it might be. Now, well, let's get in there. Right. You want my gun? No, I'll use the handcuffs. Let's see if I can knock a hole in the top half of the window here. Wait a minute. You better use your handkerchief. Let me borrow yours. Yeah. All right. I look at There, that does it. I'll go on in and open the door. Yeah, I'll meet you out in front. All right. Dusty. Yeah. Water's running someplace. Wait a minute. Yeah. Sounds like it's come from over there. Yeah. Better turn it off. Yeah. Better call a crime lab, huh? Yeah. Kind of a rough one, isn't it? Yeah. Looks like she put up quite a fight. Blood stains all over the place. Yeah. Look here. Huh? I guess this is what killed her. Yeah. Butcher knife. From a picture in the description that we'd gotten from Winifred Crocker, we identified the victim as the missing woman, Bertha Gillespie. We put in a call for the crime lab. Lee Jones and his crew came out and went over the place. The rest of the restaurant seemed to be in order. There was no sign of a struggle of any kind except in the bathroom where the body had been found. The murder weapon, the butcher knife, was dusted for prints, as was the rest of the restaurant, but the parcels that the crime lab came up with were worthless for classification. They would be sufficient, however, for comparison if we caught the killer. The search of the personal effects of the dead woman revealed no further information to aid us in apprehending her killer. The $2,500 that she was known to have had when she was last seen was missing. 621, the men from the crime lab finished their investigation on the scene, and the coroner's office was called. They came out and removed the body. They also locked the door and affixed the coroner's seal. 6.45 p.m. Frank and I got back to our car to go down to the office. Well, let's go, Frank. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Hold it, Frank. Huh? That's oh, a little kid. You guys the cops? Yeah, son. What's the matter? A lot of excitement around here, huh? Yeah, that's right. Something we can do for you? No. I figured maybe there's something I can do for you. What do you mean? You know who did the murder yet? Why do you say it was a murder, son? I know who did it. The working detective has learned by experience that approximately 60% of all homicides are solved within 20 minutes after the arrival of the authorities. Two things are necessary in establishing the identity of a killer. Motive and opportunity. In the present instance, we had the motive. $2,500 that the dead woman had withdrawn from her account was missing. However, a month had passed between the time the actual murder had taken place and it had been discovered. Ample time for the killer to cover his track. Now, before we could leave the scene, we had a witness who stated that he could name the killer for us. We asked the boy to get into the back seat of the police car while Frank and I questioned him. What's your name, son? Gordon Eric. Kids all call me Gordy. Uh-huh. How old are you? Seven. Now, what's all this about you being able to tell us who killed Mrs. Gillespie? I can. Well, who was it? Mr. Medina. You mean the man who owns the building? Yeah, that's who I mean. Well, that's a pretty serious charge, Gordon. Do you have any way to prove that? I guess I really can't prove it, but I know it's true. Well, how do you know? I just know, that's all. I seen him there. I just seen him going in there now. Well, when was this? Three weeks ago. Maybe a month. But he used to go in and out all the time. Argue with Mrs. Gillespie. What do you mean by argument? No. Mr. Medina screamed at Mrs. Gillespie. Well, you ever hear any of these arguments, son? Sure. My mother's a friend of Mr. Gillespie. We just live a couple blocks away on Dewey Street. I play over here all the time. I've heard Mr. Medina yell at and yell at her. What they argue about, son? Mostly about lease or something. Seems like Mr. Medina wants Mrs. Gillespie to move out. She didn't want him. Made him pretty sore. You gotta talk to him. He'll tell you the same thing. About how he used to fight with her. All right, son. Your mother ever hear any of these fights? Sure. You ask her. She'll tell you the same way just that I did. Okay, is she home now? Should be. Maybe she went out to the store or something. She should be home. 
Okay, son. Let's go, Frank. Yeah. Yes, this is about the most excitement we've had for a long time. Yeah. Poor old Mrs. Lefty. Real nice old lady. Real nice. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't hardly anybody that didn't like her. Hardly anybody. How about Mr. Medina? 7.04 p.m. We drove young Gordon Eric to his home and talked with his mother. She verified his story about the arguments between the victim and Medina. She went on to say that Medina had threatened Mrs. Gillespie, saying that if she wouldn't vacate the premises, he'd take care of her. We had their statements taken, and at 8.40 p.m. we went by Medina's house and asked him to accompany us downtown. He finally agreed, although he was sullen and uncooperative. When we got him down to the office, we checked his name through the record bureau, but we found that he had no criminal record in Los Angeles. His prints were rolled and sent to Holland Stahl for comparison with those found on the murder weapon. While we waited for the results, we talked to him in the squad room. You're going to regret this, you know that. Yeah. I'm telling you, you dragged me down here with all these questions. You, you just wait till my lawyers get here. You put a stop to all this foolishness. You want to tell us what it's all about, Medina? Tell you about what? How one of my tenants got herself killed. Now listen. I got property all over town, a lot of tenants. I worried about each one of them. I wouldn't have no time to do nothing else. We understand you had some pretty big arguments with Mrs. Gillespie. Who said that? Who, who told you that? Is it true? Why, it's a lie. You bring the person in here who said it, and I'll tell them it's a lie right to their face. You just bring them in here. We can't do that, and you know it. Well, of course you can. You know why? You want me to tell you? Go ahead, you tell me. You can't show the person who said that because there ain't no such person. There's anybody in the world who says, I'll argue with Bertha. Uh-huh. You try to get her to break her lease with you? That's none of your business. I told you before, I'm not about to answer a lot of questions that are none of your concern. A couple of things we better set you straight on, mister. You're a suspect in a murder. Now, if you're smart, you're going to realize that and give us some straight answers. You just wait till my lawyer gets here. He'll take care of all this. He's going to fix you for taking my fingerprints. I still don't think you had any right to do that. No right at all. Oh, yeah. Homicide, Frank. Yeah, huh? How many? All right. Thank you. You want to tell us why you killed her, Medina? What are you talking about? That was our fingerprint, man. They checked your prints against the ones we found on the murder night. They matched perfectly. Mm. You sure of it? They're sure. All right. I didn't mean to do it. I really didn't mean to, honestly. Just all of a sudden, I got so mad. I was standing there smiling. You should have known this. She had a way of smiling at you, and you knew that there wasn't anything that you could do. You just stand there smiling. I didn't mean to kill her, though. You've got to believe that. I didn't mean to kill her. Want to tell us how it happened? Have you got a cigarette? Yeah. There you go. Thanks. Here's a match. I had a chance to lease the place to some other people. More money. I tried to get her out. Go ahead. I tried to talk to her. I tried to get her to retire. She had enough money. She didn't ever have to worry. All I wanted her to do was to get out. But she wouldn't. She said I'd sign the lease with her and she was going to keep it. How much difference was there between what she was paying and what the new people were going to give you? Fifty dollars a month. Who killed her for that? Oh, yeah, you don't understand. You've got to try. Now, really, this is important. If you knew, Bertha, you'd know why I did it. You see, I went to her. I, I told her that I'd give her a lease on another piece of property. I, I, I'd give it to her at less money. I, I was trying to be fair. You could see that. I wanted to be fair. Mm-hmm. Well, that Saturday night, I, I decided to have it out with her. I went over to talk. tried to convince her that she wouldn't listen. She just wouldn't listen. I tried everything to make her listen, but she wouldn't. She just stood there and told me that she had the lease and that she was going to keep it. She just stood there with that superior smile of ours, like she knew it all. Makes you want to kid her as hard as you could. If you knew her, you'd see what I mean. You, you'd see, you'd see. You take the money? Yes. I don't know why I did that. Just all of a sudden, I got so mad at her, I... Picked up the knife, and I killed her. I didn't mean to. Honest, I didn't. As soon as I saw her, I was sorry. I was real sorry. Yeah. Did you turn that water on? Well, I guess so. You see, I, I don't remember too good. I I washed my hands after I killed her. I remember that. I guess I, 
I guess I did leave the water on. I guess I did, yeah. All right. Do you want to get the stock for Frank? Sure. Thanks. You've seen the way she thought she was so much better than anybody else you know. Is that right? And sure. All those old hands clucking around all the time, building her up, making her feel superior, real superior. Uh-huh. If she just moved out, if she just let me have the place, it all would have been all right. If she'd just done that. That's a lot of money, you know. Fifty dollars a month. That's what I stood to make on the deal. Yeah. It was worth it, don't you think? Fifty dollars a month without turning a hand? Everybody figured that way, wouldn't they? Well, everybody thinks so. Now, when you get where you're going, you can ask him. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 10th, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Virgil Emil Medina was tried and convicted of murder in the second degree and received sentence as prescribed by law. Murder in the second degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of from five years to life. Thank <laughs> you.